thanks everybody for coming to this episode of Coming Home with John Allen. I am looking forward to sharing this conversation with you. It was a great one. I really enjoyed talking to Adam O'Shea. He is a dedicated family man, a scientist for you eggheads out there, a musician for you metalheads out there. We talk about everything and anything. He's a great guy. I really enjoyed this. Check it out. This is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Let's just talk. Let's just talk. The episode with you, as I was saying before we started recording, is in the top five of all of the conversations I've had. Why do you think that is? Brag on yourself a little. (laughs) Why are people so interested in what we had to say? Well, I think that hopefully it was because of the interesting conversation, but... um, if I was to look a little bit, little bit more objectively, I um, I definitely promoted it on Facebook. So all my friends in America, you know, probably gave a listen to it to kind of see how things are going here with me. And, uh, and also I have a lot of friends here in Norway too. And so I told everyone, I texted everyone I know and said, <sighs> hey, hey, I'm on this awesome podcast, of, you know, that kind of centralized on Americans in Norway and their experience here. You heard in people, awesome podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Definitely. <laughs> Well, you do a good job here. I mean, it, well, you're like 200 podcasts in at this point now. Too, 205 right? published, and I have three in the vault. Yeah, so you're a veteran. I mean, so this I'm is a veteran. A, yeah. <laughs> no, I said a while ago, you're like the kind of the Joe Rogan of um, of Norway. I, you know, I've since <clears throat> from that point, I've, I've kind of gotten down on Joe Rogan because I think that he kind of promotes some dangerous things sometimes. and I, you, He does. If, uh, if we can take... Joe Rogan, if we can call me the Joe Rogan of Norway, minus the promotion of conspiracy theory, yep. minus the coddling of some extremist, quasi far right wing rhetoric, uh, then okay, I can be, I can, I can go with that. The the Joe Rogan of Norway, in the sense that he has a background in athletics at a high level, so do I. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's health conscious, so am I even though I'm all jacked up from all these stupid uh, shoulder op- uh, operations. I am, I am fitness-minded people. So there's, there's a couple of things there that can be comparable. But good gosh, is he... The, the coddling of that right-wing rhetoric. Yeah. I, I get it to have a discussion with someone who has that way of thinking. I, I did that just a couple... Uh, well, yesterday's, yesterday's yep. episode. And that guy's actually coming back as well. But I hope I didn't coddle him. I think I challenged him on every statement he made, and that's what I miss from Joe Rogan. Yeah, and I think that it's good that he does bring on these kind of right-wing people because you know it puts a light on it, shines a light on the ugly. Yes, and I believe in that. The ugly needs to be seen. Where I got turned off from him was um, he had I think it was Dan Crenshaw or Ben Shapiro, one of these right-wing persons on there, and (laughs) they were talking about Trump, and they were saying, "Oh well." I remember when Trump got elected that the liberals were rooting for the economy to tank so that he would look bad. And I was like, whoa, 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 I whoa, never, whoa. Uh, yeah, I know that, exactly. That doesn't happen. Yeah, no. Show me one clip of someone on MSNBC saying, oh, I hope the economy tanks to make Donald Trump look bad. No one thinks that way. But isn't that typical of the right? They will just make these blanket statements, and I think they've gotten used to their followers, their constituency, not being very well informed outside of what they tell them to be informed about. So they can say these things and get away with it. Yep, there's no check on it. I mean, None. They, they, None they're not held to accountable, so they just, okay, and that's the way it is. And I was thinking all the millions of fans of his that hear that, and they're like, oh, yeah, liberals wanted the economy to tank. Yeah, Joe Rogan just said it. Yeah, right. and I was, like, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No but one... that's what they do. Joe Rogan said it, so it must be. Yeah. Ben Shapiro said it, so it must be. Um, that Norwegian guy, uh, I, I shouldn't call him that Norwegian guy. I should put his name on. His name is Hans Jakob Winsness, and, and I think he means well. Uh, but he is a guy, oddly enough, a Norwegian who is very into the, the Republican right-wing rhetoric. He's very much into that. But he is a typical case where he hears Thomas Sowell say this, that, or the other. He hears Ben Shapiro uh, say this, that, and the other, Jordan Peterson, and he just runs with it. He doesn't look for the counterpoint, the counter, the other side of that statement. They hear it, they just run with it. This is the truth. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I heard the podcast last night, and uh, I thought you did a very good job trying to 
keep them <laughs> to the line and try to answer. That questions. That guy had me sweating. I was. I, I shouldn't call him that guy. I, I don't want to. I don't want to demonize him. I don't want to take his identity away. Uh, but Hans Jakob really had me uh, fr- frustrated. I think I was a little bit in shock that a Norwegian would actually have some of those viewpoints that he had. It's not. It's not common. No, this is a very. Um progressive kind of liberal country and you know of course we have the democratic socialism here that kind yeah. of is a security blanket which i love which is yeah. something i think america could, could use a little a little bit a lot of actually so i think finding a norwegian is a diamond in the rough i don't think there's a lot of sure. americans here even that are leaning republican no those of us who have come here to norway to live we're generally left-leaning we're generally open to the the democratic socialist way of doing things we enjoy the, the the benefits that we get from the social system here in Norway. Yeah. Uh, it'd be kind of odd to be a right-wing American living here with this these goods that we get and you have an opposing philosophy while yeah. you're taking advantage of those goods. Yeah, and, That would be weird. And, you know, that's the... I, I can talk a lot of great things about Norway because I, you know, I can go through my experience and so forth in a little bit and kind of explain about how yeah, I got we're here we're going to get so into forth. that, yeah. But um, we don't have poverty here. Right. And I think that that is a real stark contrast. When I go back to the States and I see the homelessness and the poverty, yeah. it, it shouldn't be like that. And the conversations of people who are otherwise solidly middle class, but they talk about their medical bills. Yep. Or they talk about their fear of what happens if... Yeah, they're one paycheck away from being in yes. trouble. Yeah, and yet otherwise you would think they're a solid middle class person with no worries, but they have that worry. That healthcare thing is over the heads of a lot of Americans, and I don't understand why it's not being taken care of. Yeah, I, and at the risk of sounding too liberal, I think that if you spend tax money on healthcare and education, a lot of the other problems kind of take care of themselves. Well, you're right, yeah. And I don't think that's a liberal viewpoint. That's just a fact. Yeah. I mean, and I'll tell you right now, I broke my arm here a couple of years ago and I went to the hospital. It cost me, I think, fifteen, twenty dollars in in fees, yeah. and I got a cast, an X ray, an examination by a doctor, and they fixed my arm. Uh eight, nine shoulder operations, um, a neck operation. I, I don't know where I would be if all of this happened to me back home. I would certainly be jobless. Mm. I would certainly be out of the market for being able to do anything. And I would probably be in that position with nothing to fall down, a, a zero coverage when it comes to uh, to health insurance. Here, it's, it's, it's not an issue. I don't recall paying a dime <laughs> for any of my uh, procedures. I mean, we have what we call an egg in Ondel. It's like a, um, uh, a copay. Uh, here in Norway, when uh, when 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 things happen, but it's so insignificant. You know, it's a couple hundred bucks. You yeah, know? I mean, I think it's fantastic. I mean, that being said, you know, if you go to the hospital for something that's not an emergency, you tend to wait in line sometimes, and we do pay taxes. That definitely a lot of that does go to the. the but do you notice those taxes? Not really. Not, not compared to the United States. I mean, I was paying health insurance and dentists, and, and by the time, the paychecks are almost the same. It's just a matter of what they spend the tax money on here. Yeah. And I think that yeah. spending yeah. it on, yeah. like I said, education and health care, it's the best thing you can do. Well, the tax situation is a talking point for the right back in America. You know, they'll, they'll say, look at Sweden, look at Scandinavia. Uh, they kind of bunch it all together. Look at Scandinavia, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. They're paying so much in taxes. They're crushing the people. Do we pay a lot in taxes here? Yes. But do, is it noticeable? I don't notice it. I remember when I came here, I was, I was like, oh, my God, you know, 30 percent income tax. Yeah. Oh my God. And I was really worried about that. But after the first couple of paychecks, I get the money that I get after those taxes. I get the benefits of those taxes, you know, and what is there to think about? You're right. It's a, it's not this traumatic, all encompassing government overreach that the right back home in America will have it to be. It's a myth. It's a trope that they say on Fox news that, Oh, well, point. they pay all these, these taxes here. But John Adams famously said, taxes are the price we pay to live in a civilized society. So, you know, and that's very well said by John Adams. Yeah. So, I, like I said, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the social welfare system that we have here, and I think that it, it works pretty well. I got to stay home with my daughter for the first nine months of her life when she was born. Snoopy stayed yeah. home for six weeks. I stayed home for nine months. My job was there waiting. I got full pay. Where? where Okay, what's wrong with that? I'll pay taxes to have that. Well, we can start right away, and I can start talking <laughs> about why I'm here in Norway, because that was Do a big that. driver. Because what happened was, we were living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we loved it. We never thought we were going to leave. From, are you from Massachusetts? Yes. Yep. I, don't, I don't hear it in your, in your you accent. You know, a lot of people say that to me. I think that when I was like 
eight or nine years old, I heard a Boston <laughs> accent and I said, okay, I don't really want to sound like that. You know, so I made a conscious or subconscious decision to say, Suppress. okay, pr pronounce my words the right way. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm from Boston okay. and, um, you know, lived there my whole life, except for when I went to university at University of Maryland for my undergraduate. Terrapins. But, yeah, go Terps. It's good. Terps, to the, yeah. Good, good, good to get that in. I had a scholarship offer from them for football. I didn't that's take a, it though. It's a good football school. It sure is, and it really was back then in the late '80s. Yeah, uh, should have done it. Boomer Sison and, and uh, Frank yeah. Reich. I mean, yeah. they've, they've had some good players get yeah. through there. But um, what happened was we were living in Cambridge, and we had a kid. And I mean, now that I look back at it, I can't believe it. Is that my wife only got three months maternity leave, and I didn't get any paternity leave. I got yeah. a day off. I think they gave me a day off just to be nice the day my son was born. And then Did I you had say to three weeks or three months. She got three months. She got three months. Okay. Yeah. I got nothing. You got nothing. Yeah. So I had to use a vacation day, my son's second day of life. And I just, <sighs> you know, and that, that was kind of a shock, but we're like, okay, fine. That's the deal. We got through the kind of the infancy thing. And then when we had to go to daycare after the three months, we were dropping our kid off at eight in the morning, picking him up at <laughs> five, six o'clock at night. And <laughs> we had to pay for it. Yeah. So we looked at each other. We go, what the hell are we doing here? You know, we're just working to pay for daycare yeah. and we're not seeing our kid at That's all. That's not a life. No. That's so, not... so I said, you know what? Let's give it a shot. Let's go over to Norway. There are some biotech companies there. I think I can get a job. I'm assuming your wife is Norwegian. She's Norwegian. Yes. Okay. So we're going to talk about how you guys met because I don't think I know that story either. Yep. But go, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so then we decided like, okay, you know, let's give it a shot. So in December of 20. 2010, we, uh, the three of us moved over here and, you know, we didn't have an apartment. So we had to stay kind of in the grandmother apartment that was attached to my in-laws house. So I lived with my in-laws for, I think four or five years. Um, oh, that long? Yeah. Well, we had to save yeah. money to kind of get a down payment on a house and I didn't get a job for the yeah. first year, which was actually a good thing because I got to spend all that time with my newborn uh, son. There you go. Yeah. So I'm very fortunate that I got, before he started Barnahagen, which is the daycare kindergarten that they have here, um, I was able to spend the first year of his yeah. life. So I taught him how to walk and, yeah. you know, really had those good bonding. That's, that's time you can't get it's, back. It's, so it's, it's precious. Yeah. It was very valuable. And I see the effects of that to this day. My daughter is going to turn 18 in a couple of weeks and I see the effects of having those nine months, just me and her. Yeah. It's, it's golden. You can't trade that in for nothing. Yep. So then when my son, um, finally got into Barnahog and then I started to go and look and say, okay, I got to find a job now. And I checked every biotech company. It, my background is in science. I have a uh, master's degree in biotechnology. So I've always worked in kind of startup drug development companies, mostly working with monoclonal antibodies, sometimes conjugated with a radionuclide or conjugated with a toxin to do targeted radio. Listen to this guy. You need to get on Joe Rogan. Be one of the scientists that he... <laughs> yeah, I'll try, not, I'll try not to nerd it up too much here. No, but, do it. Uh, I, I love it. I love, and if there's anything that we think that the listeners and viewers won't understand, you can just explain it. But I love that kind of talk. I do. Yeah, my son does too. And he told me, Papa, talk about science. Talk about science. That's yeah. a strong thing. Because yeah. he's, uh, he's 13 now and we do a lot of science together. So I've okay. been teaching him a lot of organic chemistry now is what we've been focusing on. What so, a way to bond. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. you know what? We have a lot of good bonding thing. He's a drummer in my band. Yeah, and you He's guys a drummer in my band. Yeah. He's the first baseman on my baseball team. And, you know, he's my science partner. So yeah. we have a we have a lot in common. And, and we yeah. do great. You know, at some point, he's going to be too cool for me. You know, I'm dreading that day. But It's coming. My son is 15. And I think he's, I, I catch him every once in a while looking at me like I'm still that that superhero type of guy. And, but I'm wondering, when is that going to end? It does happen. because <laughs> He's I, already taller than me. So he's already physically looking down yeah. on, so that might be the start no it, it happens though because i sure, can i can does. remember when i thought my dad was a god and then like there was one day i don't know 16 yeah. 17 and i was like wait a second he's just a regular guy yeah i mean sorry dad yeah. i love you you're a superstar <laughs> but but you know, but i mean when, when young boys growing up they, they they can idolize their dad and wow he knows everything you know and it's well yeah and you want to be that guy as a father yeah you know um uh, what's the alternative? Yeah. You have a kid exactly. who has zero respect for you. You know, you have a kid who doubts you. You have a kid that doesn't want to emulate you. Yep. And, you know, um, as much as I want to take, he's a great kid. He does good in school. He's super well behaved. He's, he's just a pleasure to have around. And as much as I want to credit for my wife and I's good parenting, he does it on his own. So I got to give him credit where credit is due. So well, I'll say this, but let me give you some credit. He does it on his own now because you guys put the you put him on the right path. Oh, you're gonna give me a big head, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, but but I think that if the job is done right, then around that age, 12, 13, 14, that's when you kind of start to see that they're incorporating the parenting that you put into them without you having to remind them. Yeah, I mean, you know the, what I'm saying? So that yeah, that's you. That's you and your wife having done the right thing. Yeah, he's being mature and he's doing things on his own, but you put him on that path. But I mean, may, And maybe that's kind of the deal as parents because sure. you know that they're going to be on their own at some point. Yeah. So you just try to load them up with the best tools you can to make the best <clears> decisions <throat> and not do stupid things. And then, But at some point, he's going to be on his own. Yeah. He's going to be an adult on his own. He's 13 now. So, I mean, I got five, six more years before he's moving out of the yeah, house and yeah. going to college and getting <clears> a job. And Well, you guys have done it right. You know, it, unfortunately, in the work that I've done, I see a lot of parents who don't really start parenting until their kid is 15, 16 years old. They start, oh, my gosh, you know, now he's going to go out into the world or she's going to go out. Now I've got to do It's kind of too late. Yeah. So you start that stuff from the cradle and you walk them through that stuff so that they are on their own doing the right thing. Yep. And we, we were older when we had our child too. Um, I mean, so we. you know, there, there's yeah. no, there's no test to have, have a kid. Anyone. How can, old are you? I'm 46. Oh gosh. So still a child. man. Yeah. I know you think so. I, I'm starting <laughs> to feel it a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I still think I'm still in the prime of my life and so forth. But, um, Holy Lord. Do you guys hear that? It's probably coming through the mic. There's a garbage truck pick, picking up the garbage out there, but we'll just talk through it. Yeah. So, um, but there's no, there's no test to have a baby. Anyone can make a baby. But right. some people really shouldn't be parents unless you're really prepared for it because it's a big, big job and a big commitment. So I think, I don't think it's ever too early. Well, I think you come to a certain age and maybe that age is 16, 17, 18. Let's say when you're sexually active, hopefully the parenting has given you as that older teen, it's given you a sense of consequence. Uh, you know, you can get pregnant or you can get a girl pregnant and there comes a responsibility with that. And hopefully there's a certain type of parenting that puts that knowledge into a kid's mind. Yep. Unfortunately, as we see, there's a lot as well, I can tell you in Norway, uh, uh, up North where we were living, that late teen pregnancy in our little county that we lived in was so common. Mm. Tons of 16, 17 year olds unmarried, but with a kid, sometimes two. I mean, very I, common. Yeah. But How, when you talk to, well, when you talk to the parents, you see why that happens. Yeah. There's no, there's no discussion about, and part of it is religious. It's the less steady on it, uh, 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 religious uh, um, segment up there. And they just don't talk about those things. It's yeah. a no-no. And, and how is a 16, 18-year-old kid prepared to be a parent? I, I look at back at myself. Not, yeah. I look at back at myself. I was an idiot back then. You know, I was yeah. partying and yes. yeah. whatever. Yeah. I didn't care about anything. Yeah. I had barely any responsibility. Just go to school or get a job just to pay for the rent. I, yeah. I, I was an idiot back then. So I... I think for us, at least, it was very beneficial to wait until, you know, sure, I was, sure. I was, I guess, 30 years old or something, yeah. you know, by the time I had a kid. Yeah. And uh, my wife was, was four years younger than me, so. I was 26. 31 when I met Snoopy. I was 36 when we had our daughter. Yep. So, um, it doesn't hurt to wait, but it does. Yeah. Because, I don't, I don't know, uh, Bill Burr, the, 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 the Boston yep. uh, comedian, has a great bit about this. Uh uh, he's an older dad. I think he was in his late forties when he and his wife had their first kid. And he jokes about how he takes his kid to the park and you got these 25, 30 year old dads, you know, they're practically on the, you know, the jungle gym and the swings and stuff with their kids while Bill is just sitting down kind of rubbing his knees and <laughs> yeah. trying to work the kinks out of his shoulder and stuff. So there's that thing about having kids. I felt that, that I didn't really have that get up and go jump on the trampoline with the kids yep. type of energy. I just, I was too old for that. Yeah. Yep. Phys physically, not mentally. I wanted to, <laughs> but yep. I couldn't physically. I hear you. But you know, as far as kind of to tying up the parenting thing, I got a great kid. I think we waited up yeah. later in life. I think that was a, a, a good move for at least us, but to each his own, you know, to each his some, own. some people are prepared to have a kid when they're 18, you know, because back in our parents day, it was normal for them to have a kid at 18 yep. and two by the age of 20 or three. Yep. You know, they did it, they, they flipped it, they did it, that, and that seemed to but work. then, also, the flip side of that is that, you know, by the time they're out of the house, you're still young enough to kind of enjoy life, too. Right. Yeah, 
I'm going to push back on that, though. Um, like I said, our daughter is going to turn 18 here in, in a few weeks. Our son is, is going to turn 16 in a little while. So in a couple of years, they're both going to be gone, probably studying somewhere, whether it's back in the States or somewhere here in Norway, but probably out of the house. And a lot of people, some of my friends tease me, oh, gosh, you're not going to be able to play when your kids are gone. But I am. Yeah. Because it's just, it's, it's, you know, you're used to what you're used to. You know what you know. And I'll be 58 by the time our son moves out. And I'm ready to play. Yep. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Age ain't nothing but a number. I well, well, shout I, out to I, R. Kelly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're a metal guy. Yes. You can, you can name drop R. Kelly. Oh, yeah. How about yeah, that? Great. So, <laughs> great. <laughs> yep. I am, I am a metal guy, though. Uh, like I said, I... Uh, I'm kind of the opposite. I'm more grounded in the soul R&B, a little bit of class work, but I also do like the metal. I just, especially when I'm playing guitar, I love going fast and hard. And, you know, there's my son a, too. There's he, a, a primal physical thing about that. Yeah, it's an adrenaline guitar. rush. Yes. It feels really good, especially yeah. like when you're playing with other people and yeah. you're and you're, you're on the same page and everything's going yeah. well. I mean, it just, it feels really good. So, I, yeah. I mean, also, I mean, I grew up loving Slayer, Metallica, Pantera. Those those were the bands I that I got, got into, into first. Slayer. Oh, they're fantastic. I never... <laughs> Never got into them. Fantastic band. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so like I said, though, we have a band. Um, you know, we're called Bloodstain from Rickon. We're hoping to play our first show this year. And oh, you guys haven't played out yet? No. We, okay. We got to tie it up a little bit tighter before okay. I'm ready to take them outside. Yeah. But, I, you know, I just want to go to play a free show at the Free Teats Hoos or whatever. Yeah. And um, just to get us used to getting our gear, setting it up playing in front of live people. So yeah. we have a whiteboard in our band room and the goal is to play a show by the end of the year. Oh, I love so, it. so we work on that. We write all our songs on the whiteboard too. And Do you guys have any original our, stuff? Yeah, we have um, four or five originals. Um, Death Sentence. I mean, they're all, they're all <laughs> very <laughs> kind of Norwegian metal songs. <laughs> um, but we do, and then we do a couple. Although that could be a hip hop title. Yeah. Death Sentence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Death Row Records, right? But um, they... Uh, we do we do do a couple covers so we've been doing for whom the bell tolls and a couple pantera songs walk which and, walk of yeah, course yeah and that's fun and i like um mouth for war is, is yes. one that i really love to play i think that is uh, the vulgar display of power i think that's my favorite pantera album yep i do believe uh, so. oh it's yeah. it's definitely mine i, yeah. I love it from beginning to end yes. that Every song is just that song. album is that album just amazing yeah. from beginning to end yeah. i mean it starts off it punches you in the face and then yes. it never yeah. stops yeah that's the genius of dime we were talking a little bit earlier before we started about zach wilde kind of stepping in now for pantera and i think it's good that they're going around but dimebag daryl for those who don't know anything about pantera dimebag daryl was the guitarist for pantera and you know, more people should know about him. He is really one of the greatest guitar players of all time. I think he's highly underrated. You can never talk enough about him as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, there should be more buzz about him in the guitar world. I mean, he is respected, but it's almost like a very insular uh, cult following, those hardcore Pantera fans. And then everybody else, oh, yeah, yeah, Dime, I know who he is. But I don't, I don't think he gets his due. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this the last time I was on the podcast about how my music kind of stopped – after like 1996 or so, yeah. I, I I listened to 87 to 96. I love all the music that came out yeah. from that. From like yeah. starting with like maybe Appetite for Destruction, and then maybe I don't I don't know. I can't even think of the last. Guns and Roses really turned the music world upside down when they came out. That album just slammed into the the ears of everybody. If you listen to it now, it's a shocking album. It is. I mean, it really is. Listen to the lyrics of My Michelle. I, yeah. My son listens to that. And I'm like, whoa, he's saying yeah. that. Like, whoa, yeah. that's it. And, and you know, for that time, it was like, pretty whoa, raw. Who are, yeah. these, who are these guys? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty raw. You know, but as like a sixth or seventh grader hearing that album, I was just like, oh my God, music can be like this. And then when I heard Hit Metallica hard. Master of Puppets, I was like, yeah. oh wow. I didn't know because I'd grown up. Just listen to like classic rock, Jimi yeah. Hendrix, Cream, you know, things like my that my dad listened to. Yeah. You know, and then when I we got to the mid eighties and we got to hear Ministry and Slayer and Anthrax and I was just, whoa, yeah. this is a whole different ball game. I didn't You're know. You're sitting here like naming these bands and it's just a reminder that yet that was a pretty magical time in music. People have a people have a tendency to jump over the eighties and if you're not a grunge fan, you kind of jump over the 90s, but there's a lot of music there. Yeah, I caught, agree. The, it, it caught me anyway. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so, yeah, that's the music, though, and, uh, you know, I love playing. We have a band room at home, and it's it's just, 
also like when we talked earlier about bonding with your son, I mean, yeah. there's no better bond than him playing drums and me playing guitar. And when, we're, when, we're, when we're on the same groove and we do the changes at the right time yeah. and it sounds tight. I mean, I started him very early on drums. I kind of, you know, he, it's, it's not a secret, but I kind of wanted to have my own drummer. So, ah, so when he was, a, okay. when he was a baby, we bought him a drum him set started. and then, you know, <laughs> you prob- had plans. then probably around like, uh, maybe nine, 10 years old, yeah. I bought him a real adult yeah. drum set. And then I got him some drum lessons. We had a friend that worked at the radium hospital with me, Stig, if you're hearing this, good, good. <laughs> Shout out to you, but he's an excellent drummer, yeah. and so I can't teach drums. I okay. know my I know my limitations. I've taught him how to play guitar. He can do some power chords and things like that. Yeah, but I can't teach drums. I can play a little bit of beats. You yeah. know, I get on the drums every once in a while. But he needed to have professional lessons, and that when he started to take lessons and learn about timing and how to use the different drums in different ways, he he just skyrocketed. So you have a, uh, it's almost like an Eddie Van Halen, Wolfgang Van Halen type yep. of thing. It's family band. It's. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty cool. There, there was a time where, where both of uh, our kids, uh, Snoopy and I's kids, had an interest in music, but it just kind of faded. But I got real excited here about eight months ago when my son started asking me to, you know, we, we talk about that hero thing that fathers mm-hmm. have for sons where he's looking up to me because all this powerlifting records and championships and stuff. So he started asking me to train with me. And I stiff-armed him for a while because I didn't think he was mature enough to, you know, to take the instruction and all that stuff. But we got started about six months ago. Talk about bonding. I mean, it's it's pretty much the same thing as what you're talking about, your son and you with music. Uh, that thing of going down, and, and my, I, have, I have my own gym right here, so it's us. We're not in a commercial That's gym. Nice. It's just us. And I'm teaching him everything I know. And he's listening, and he's impressed, and he's inquisitive, and he's he's putting it to practical use. So seeing your seeing our sons do that kind of thing, it's, it's just, awesome. It's 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 a it's feedback that we've done something right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he's a great kid. I mean, I, I can't say enough about him. And academically, I think he's got a, a really <clears throat> good shot because he's you know we do the science stuff at home, so we've done a lot of chemistry and a lot of biology. He That's knows very the cool system. that he's interested in that. How does he feel? He uh, pressures I, me to ask him questions. Papa, write another uh, quadratic equation for me. Let me solve for it. the inert gas law. You know, and I so I create little quizzes for him, and then he he loves it, fills it out, and then I correct him on it and. Walk Does he have it. any other friends who have that kind of interest in not science? Not so much, no. I think it's something that I've kind doesn't of... Feel, he doesn't feel like an outsider because of that, does no, he? Not no, at all. no, not at all. I mean, he has lots of friends and, you know... Other interests They're, they're well, into video so, games and, yeah. you know, now yeah. they're starting to get into girls too. So oh, gosh, it's a little bit of, uh, little bit of that, that age. He just started Ongdom School, which is middle school here. You yeah. start that at the eighth grade here or seventh, yeah. seventh grade. Seventh, yeah. Right. So that's seventh grade here um, in Norway where I think middle school in America, you start at the sixth grade. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit different with the way they do the schools here, but, um, yeah, I mean, he, he's, he has a great group of friends. Yeah. Um, we live in Rickon, you know, it's, it's bottom. And for those of you that don't know bottom, it's, um, it's kind of a, it's a county that's right outside of Oslo and it's got a bit of a reputation because it's got the <laughs> highest income yeah. and the most educated. So I think kind of the country of Norway looks at it a little bit snobby, <laughs> but we live in Rickon and that's a little bit. You know, kind of the ghetto of, of the bottom. <laughs> the so we get, of the... we get a little street cred in, in Rick and <laughs> keeping it, it real. <laughs> well, at least there's a metal scene there, so they can't be too fancy. Though. Yeah. Got to be a little they, grounded. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, Bloodstain will be playing a show there soon. So, <laughs> but it's 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 awesome. I have, a, I have a really good life here. You know, I think that it's been uh, moving to Norway for us was a fantastic thing. I know that yeah. other Americans may have not had the same experience. There's a lot of us struggling. You know, some of them have been on my program. There's a lot of people who are struggling, but then there's also a lot of people who are doing well. Then there's a lot of people who are kind of, eh, that, that, you know, they haven't figured out yet their path through here, but they're, they, they haven't given up. So there's a lot of variation there, but I do think that the common thread with most of these Americans, uh, pro- pretty much all of them, is this 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 curiosity, this left leaning liberal mindset? Is that what you've noticed? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. One thing I want to take you to task on is I heard you on a pat podcast a few weeks Uh-oh. ago. Where Come on now. <laughs> you haven't been using this as a platform to explore the rest of Europe. So living here, we have very short flights to Edinburgh, Berlin. Guilty as charged. You Guilty. Know, Munich, Guilty. Uh, Paris, whatever. So we've taken advantage of that, you know. But I want to hold you to task because it's. <sighs> easy to get on a plane here and fly somewhere it's two hours it you're really in is. another country and it's completely different yeah, it really is and that is something that i uh, i'm glad you brought that up it's a reminder that i need to do something about that 
Uh, now, I've been here 21 years. And when Snoopy and I came here, one of the things that I talked about was, oh, my gosh, I'm in Norway. It'll be so easy to travel. And I haven't been anywhere. I, I've been all over Norway. Yeah. But this the, this this little, even a weekend vacation in London or, or to Stockholm or something like that, I, I, I haven't done it. Shame on me. Yeah, shame on you. Shame, shame. shame on me. You know, but uh, <laughs> but you also lived in northern Norway, which is a lot different, yes. I would imagine, than what it's like down here. Much different, and and there is the the what do you call it? The foreign cultural experience that I have had. Uh, I got it by experiencing pretty much everything there is to experience here in Norway, and that is a lot. Um, I, have you been up north? Uh, not so much. I've been to Trondheim once for doesn't count. Okay, doesn't count. That's as far north as I've gotten. <laughs> Trondheim. If you if you've been if you've been north of Trondheim, and if you spent any amount of time up there, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's almost a different culture. The people are so radically different, uh, in in good ways. I think uh, the most beautiful people I know are up there. Uh, I married one of them. My wife is from up there. So it's, it's you know, I, I don't want to say I haven't had any cultural experience since I've lived here because I have, but just within Norway. But yep. that trip to Rome or to 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 to, to Vienna or so, something like that, I, I, shame on me. For you got to do it. You know, and now we were. And I want to take this thing with me and talk to people. Oh, that would be awesome. Yes. That's a great yeah. idea. That's a great idea. You know, and, and just mentioning Rome, I mean, now we're at the age my parents are retired, and now they come over here, yeah. spend a few days with us in Norway, and then yeah. we pick a destination. This year we went to Rome. Oh, That's awesome. where we went. And, and my, awesome. my parents are a Christian, yeah. so to take them to Vatican City, it was oh. like it was like Mecca yeah. for them. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. just, it was so great. For, and to awesome. experience that with them. You know, I'm not, I'm not a religious guy myself. We can maybe get into that a little bit. I'm, I, I kind of... Uh, I would identify, I guess, as an atheist. You okay. Know, cause I, cause I, yeah, I, I want to definitely talk with that. Well, it's just, I grew up very Catholic. I went to a Catholic high school. So this is a protest know. then against your upbringing? I just, I got, it got, happens. I got kind of turned off by it when yeah, I was like 16. I was like, you know what? I, I don't really, this isn't really my jam, you know? And, yeah. and also like, then I started to think about it and just religions overall. It's, it's kind of crazy. I love Jesus. What turned you off? What turned you off? You love Jesus, and, start, Jesus and Jesus loves you, a Christian would say. <laughs> it started with abortion because they really ah, took a strong stance mm, on abortion. And, okay, and yeah. I was just like, you know, should they be getting involved in that? And isn't that a choice for the woman and her husband and the doctor and so forth? And I would just like a hardcore Catholic abortion uh, uh, denier to tell me, f find me the passages in the Bible that justify the... <laughs> I call it the social persecution of people who are pro-choice. Find me the passages in the Bible that back that up. Yeah. And I'm a Christian. Yeah. yeah. No, I, <laughs> so, so, so yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like Jesus, if you read the, you know, the new Testament, I love it. Help poor people, help sick people, help each other out, you know, well, he wasn't a Republican. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely. Although they've kind of hijacked him, you know, and that's... They, Laughably they kind of, so. Republicans have become the Christian party, kind of. And it's the evangelicals, too, that have kind of really joined forces there and yeah. solidified that. Yeah. But um, I don't think they should have the monopoly on Jesus Christ. I mean, it's... Uh, well, I said I, I, took it, I took it all the way as far as I could take it uh, on that episode with Hans Jakob Winsness. I told him straight up, I don't think Republicans give a shit about the teachings of Christ. No. Because they don't give a shit about the poor. They don't give a shit about pulling up people in need. They just don't. And it's provable. Look at their policy or lack thereof. Yep. There's there's the proof right there. Yeah, I agree. And also, like, I mean, if you just want to keep talking about abortion, uh, you know, they care so much about this unborn baby. But then as soon as the baby's born, forget about it. Thank you. Sorry. Exactly. You know, whatever. And, and, that's, and I struggle to find the Christianity in that. Yeah. I agree. And, you know, my father, who is very Christian and very devout Catholic, mm -hmm. he's very pro-choice. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's a social worker and he would, um, for his, out, out his career, he would find homes for uh, foster kids yeah. and, and things like that. And he was very um, pro placing them in gay marriage families. And that was... He was working for Catholic Charities, and they were against that, and there was a conflict there, and I don't want to get into so much details about that, but I think that my dad's Christianity is really more reflective of the way that Jesus viewed yeah. things, you know? So Jesus, whether all the stuff is true of him or not, fine. I don't believe he's the son of God or anything like that, 
but I think the message of helping each other, helping sick people, helping poor people, yeah, yeah. that's, that's I can't, beautiful. Yeah. I love that. I can't find any biblical passages that justify the way people turn their backs on people in need. Yeah. When, when, when you call yourself a Christian, but you do that, you're against socialized medicine, you're against uh, uh, the so-called welfare state, and you speak so openly about your your uh, refusal to uh, to accept it when you when you demonize the people who who uh, who are in positions of need, I I can't find Jesus in that. Yep. I just can't. Yep. And I challenge them to show me, and they can't. Yeah. So so what are you doing? Yeah. Exactly. What are you doing? Yeah, it's a cudgel or something. I, I don't I don't know what's going on there, but. <clears throat> You know, it's good that you challenged them, though. If you know, if, if I did. I, I, and I'm glad I did that episode. I'm already taking heat, by the way. Uh, okay. A couple of people in social it just came out. Well, uh, uh, a couple of people already. You know, why would you give somebody like that a platform? Well, for the sake of dialogue, uh, I'm a believer in dialogue. I don't think there's going to be any significant change without it. Yeah. Um. Uh. Now, I don't know how fruitful my conversations uh, with people like that will be. I don't know, but something might come out of it. How do I know that a prominent Norwegian or American politician doesn't hear that and hear the way I, in my opinion, expertly <laughs> broke down uh, some of the things that Hans Jakob said, or at least challenged him in ways that maybe people don't see in online debates. How do I know that somebody won't see that and it might change the way they do things, which then could lead to helping people yep. where there was no help before? That's why I do it. That's I, why I do it. You know, and I 100% support that. We, you know, we talked about this a little bit when we were touching on Joe Rogan earlier. Yeah. You're not giving a platform. You're, you're providing an opportunity to have a dialogue. And that's the problem now, too, is because look at how polarized the United States is. Yes. So if, if, it's, if it becomes, I hate you and you hate me, then where are we going to go with that? Yeah. So let's not hate each other. Let's okay. You have a different point of view. Let's talk it through. Maybe I won't convince you. Maybe you won't convince me. Yeah. But dialogue is the way that yeah. we progress. And I think dialogue in a podcast format. You know, you you have dialogue on the evening news where you have a couple of talking heads who talk for maybe two and a half minutes on something. But. What can you really get out of that? Can you get an idea of what a politician or a, uh, a political talking head is about when they have this two and a half, maybe three minute long conversation on the news and it's full of just little phrases, little sound bites, and there's no substance to it. You don't get into the, 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 the mud, so to yep. speak. <clears throat> but on a podcast, I, 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 I spoke to Hans Jakob for a little over two and a half hours, if I remember right. And in those two and a half hours, it became very clear what he feels and thinks yeah. and what he has experienced. And it was also very clear about what I feel, think, and have experienced. That is true dialogue, long yeah. form. The long form. I mean, I think maybe Howard Stern started this and then Joe Rogan's kind of taken it to. You put yourself in a nice, comfortable studio, yeah. have a dialogue, you shoot the shit for a little bit kind of you know get to feel each other yeah. and then you can talk about things in a comfortable level but again the problem with joe rogan is that he'll have this okay he doesn't just have right wingers on his show he'll have a lefty on there mm. and he'll sit there and he'll nod and yes and he will actually verbalize his agreement but then the next day he'll get a righty on there with the exact opposite opinion and he'll sit there and he'll nod and he'll agree and yep. he'll verbalize it yep so it's like what are you? What are you doing, Mister Rogue? Well, you're making hundreds of millions of dollars. That's what you're doing. He's super rich, yes. <laughs> but 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 if if his goal is to challenge the status quo in any way, I don't think he's doing that. No, he's basically real good at doing this. I'm sorry, a lot of people may tear me up for that, but he's very uh, he's very good at agreeing with whoever is sitting across uh, his table, yep. speaking into the mic. He's good at that. I don't understand the purpose of that. There's entertainment value, but, and, and I don't know, maybe that's all Joe Rogan wants to do. Maybe he doesn't care about making any positive change. I don't know. That it, I, I don't know. Yeah, we, we, we Joe Rogan, call me. Yeah. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, you almost have to listen to him because some of the guests he has on are well, people that I want to hear. Sure. Oh, you know, he, he, has, he has Bill Maher on. I want to hear that. Yes. He has uh, Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age on. I want to hear that, you know, so... 
I, I, as much as I don't want to listen to them. That was a great interview, them, by the way. Yeah, yes, excellent. excellent. I'm, I'm a huge Queens of the Stone Age oh, fan. so am I. I, I love so them. Am I. I took my wife to see them here a couple of years ago, and just because I was like, okay, honey, you have to see this band. I've never this seen is, them live. This is a fantastic oh, band. Yeah. You know, now my son calls them old man music. You know? <laughs> so he gives me a little bit of crap for it, and hey, he wants to listen to more But I challenge these young kids when it comes to talent. I mean, uh, Queens of the Stone Age, are they're, they're tearing it up. Foo Fighters, they're tearing it yep. up when they're playing, and, and they're playing. It's not this overdub you know, with a backing track when they're live. Yep. It's old man music, but us old men know how to jam, okay? Oh, they're super talented. You know, yes, I mean, it's my, my dream is that he taps me and does an album. Hey, Adam, come out in the desert and record an album with us and do one tour. You know, <laughs> you know Rick Beato on YouTube? No, no. Rick Beato, I think he's 62 years old now. Uh, he's just a genius in music theory. And he's got 3 million followers, and it's across generations. He's 62 years old, and he talks about music, both old and new. And he's a perfect example of an old head who is doing it better than than people who are half his age because he's got the skills. And you don't get the skills overnight. That's longevity. Yep. So I, I, I stand up for the old guys that are still doing music. It, and, you know, this could transition to another conversation because I don't like ageism, you know, because <laughs> I don't either. I mean, look, at, I'm, I don't a, either. I'm in a band now with a 13 year old and a 15 year old yeah. and I'm 46. We yeah. almost call ourselves the ageist because we have such a yeah. variety of age, but I actually think it works for us. We have a younger kid. We have a, a teenage that's turning into a man. And then we have kind of an older man. I think that that dynamic works really well. And you know, you see how they attack Joe Biden right now with yes. his age, yeah. you know, and yeah, he's old. He's old. And you know, there are probably, you know, I, I'm a registered Democrat. You know, there are a couple people that I'd probably like, I like Amy Klobuchar, I like Elizabeth Warren, I like, Newsom, you know, yeah. that I kind of would like to be president, but yeah. when the choice is going to be a criminal idiot or an, a guy with a, that's a little bit old, lost his I'm fastball, going with fine. Grandpa, I'm going with Grandpa yeah. Joe. I mean, and you know what? With a clear conscience. He's done a good job. They they crap on him all the time. If yeah. you watch Fox News, he's the worst yeah. president of all time. It's the Biden crime family. And yeah, his son traded on his name and it does stink a little bit, you know, and we'll see how that ends up. I don't but that's think his would... son. That's not him. Yeah. But you go over to the Trump family and it's all of them it's doing, the, the they're double doing dirty they, deeds. They just block their eyes yes. and say, yes. I don't want to see this. It's yes. this. And the thing is, you don't see or I don't see Democrats lining up to form a wall of defense around Hunter Biden. What I hear is, OK, if he's done something wrong, yeah. get him. He's got a, he's got a kid that had drug problems that probably traded on his name, you know, and a lot of people have kids in their families that have struggled with drug issues. I mean, I know that you've dealt with that personally yeah. in your life and uh, you know, every family has that kind of stuff. He's referring to my son, uh, passed away heroin overdose, uh, 19th, uh, I'm sorry, 5th fi uh, of November, 2019. Yep. May he rest in peace. Yeah, sorry to, sorry, I to bring, have to, sorry to bring up the subject. No, there, no, no, but, no, no. Uh, please don't be. So, I you I use that all the time as um, actually a moment of inspiration. Yep. Uh, every chance I get, I say his name. I say what he died from and when he died. Uh, uh, the purpose of saying his name is to just hold him in memory. The purpose of saying what he died from is just to shine a light on that problem with yep. opioids. Uh, the purpose of saying the date of it is to show that it wasn't that long ago. I'm still hurting, but I'm functioning. Yeah. So hopefully that's an inspiration to people out there. It so is, it's no it, big deal to bring it up at it, all. It is inspiring how you handle that because that thank, must thank have been you. really um, a devastating time for you. Soul crushing. Yeah. Soul crushing. Uh, I can imagine. But, um, but, you know, every family in America has, has, something. has something like yeah. that. Yeah. You know? So yeah. Yeah. it's so common over there, too. And, I mean, everyone knows the story about the Oxycontin and they just flooded the market yeah. with it and then it created all these problems and they have drug addicts and they can't afford the oxy so then they go to heroin and fentanyl is now a big problem there which for some reason the republicans say is a border problem but yeah, I, 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 think it's, I, 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 I think it's i think it's i think it's a drug problem that we need to address in a different way yeah yeah and if it's a border problem well then that's 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 that crosses both political parties because you have Republican presidents, Democratic president. You have a Republican-controlled Congress, Democrat-controlled con Congress. So, so you can't point the finger and say that's a lefty problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's a righty problem. I mean, that border has had issues for yes. 50 years. So. so I think I think it's good to talk about those things. And, and again, I, I use my son's passing and what he passed from uh, as, as a, uh, uh, a moment of inspiration for myself. Every time it gets mentioned, it's a reminder. Okay, John, hang in there. This happened, but hang in there and and use it. Use yep. this. That you know, that's a great way to deal with that. I, that I memory. think so. It's working so far. Yeah, well, still here, still doing my thing. Yeah, still marching absolutely. forward. Absolutely. Um, gosh, we're talking about all kinds of stuff. Here. Yeah, going back and forth, <laughs> politics, music. But that's parenting. the long. That's the long. That's the long form thing. 
what do, what do you think is going to happen uh, in this upcoming election in the states? Do you think oh, Joe Biden is going to stick it out and run, or do you think a Democrat is going to jump in? That's A. B. Do you think Trump will? <laughs> I I, th- I think Trump is going to win the Republican dump. Uh, Absolutely, uh, I think that's a no-brainer. But if he gets convicted, do you think he will step down? No, nope. no. I think he'll run from jail and then he'll uh, hope try to pardon himself and walk yeah. out of jail and say, "I'm the president now." Yeah. It, this next coming election scares the hell out of me. I got to be honest with me you. Too. I, I don't. I cannot believe that one person would vote for Trump, let alone seventy yeah. million. Yeah. I mean, it's just. My problem with Trump, okay, and I don't want to just hack on Trump. I mean, definitely, hack on Trump. definitely, <laughs> definitely, I think that his huge tax cut for the rich, when there's so much wealth disparity in the United States, where you got millionaires and billionaires having rocket companies and homeless people, yeah. the juxtaposition of that is just disgusting. And his big tax cut for the rich at that time was terrible. He polarized things. You know, he he. He did a bunch of terrible things. But what I dislike about Trump the most is the way that he took advantage and used my fellow Americans. He doesn't Uh, give a crap about all those people at his rallies. He's using you. Oh, yeah, Yeah. let me feed off a white male grievance. I'm angry about my life, and it's their fault and their fault. And he gave them a platform. He used you. He doesn't care about you. You know, and it breaks my heart when I see... You know, my one uncle on Facebook that posts crazy things and my one yeah. friend from high school that, you know, is a Biden crime family and Trump is the greatest yeah. president yeah. of all time. Yeah. I'm just like, guys, he doesn't care about you. That he was able to dupe so many people is fascinating. Yeah, it's impressive. It, well, you gotta say, you have to say that. He's done something credit, right. I mean, He's done something right. He learned how to feed into that. I don't know. What is it? Uh, that social insecurity. Yeah. That um, that defeated attitude that a big segment of of, of white America had, uh, the racist element, the yep. bigoted element. He knew how to tap into that, and he, now he has his following, and it's called MAGA. Yeah. And for those who, I I, I say it straight up, <clears throat> I, I I question whether or not a person is racist, bigoted, misogynistic, and I lean towards the affirmative answer when you are a MAGA zealot yeah because that is what that man stands for yeah that is what that movement stands for so are you a hypocrite then you don't stand for that but you're going to wear the red hat and you're going to vote for that guy so make it make it make sense Uh, and and I challenge people uh you know before I fully full-on point a finger and call somebody a bigot racist misogynist I ask them to please make that make sense and so far nobody's been able to do it they can't. They and can't. It's just they the can't. logic's not there. And, uh, you know, back to your question about Biden. I I don't think he's going to be the candidate when it comes down to it. I think when it comes down to it, he's going to step aside. Yep. I think that it was great what he did to come in after COVID and after Trump to kind of get, let's get an we adult, needed him. Let's get an we adult needed him. in the office. You know? Didn't we? We yes, needed we, him. We needed yes. him. Yes. Desperately. Desperately. But now? But also, I mean, think about what would the next four years of Trump look like? It's just going to be their revenge porn. They're just going to sick any agency. they can. not good for America. No, he's going to fire everyone in the DOJ, put his cronies in there, and say, let's go after Hillary Clinton, and let's go after Joe Biden. It's good for Trump, but how is that good for America? I want someone to explain that to me. How would that be good for America? So we we needed Joe Biden uh, last election. Uh, I guess we need him now, if nobody else in the Democrats among the Democrats steps up uh, or, or is allowed to step up. Hint, hint. I have to say that. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but again, is he the best possible candidate? My answer is no. No. And I, I agree. My with answer completely. is no. I mean, um, the, the problem too I'll is, support him. is that who's the next in line then? Would it be Harris? She's obviously the vice president and it usually would go that way that, okay, she has four years, but people hate people her. People hate her. And she's been so silent these yep. last two and a half years. Yep. Where is she? What has she done? Uh, and I say that with an open heart because I felt so good about her being in there. She was fantastic I, on in the Senate and, and yes. she was in the Judiciary Committee. Was she excited. was fantastic. I, I was I, loved I was her. so happy when she was picked as his running mate, and then so happy that she's the first black female, uh, black first female, first black female uh, vice president. That made me feel good uh, in a nostalgic sense. I was proud, you know. Uh, but what? 
what about all these months and years since then? Yeah. Where has she been? And it kind of makes me doubt how effective she would be if she were to become president. Also, I have nothing yeah. against her, so to speak. I guess I guess I miss her. I miss yeah. her because I felt like she could have been much more involved, much more effective than what she has been. So I don't know. There, I'm sure there's some Democrat st- uh, strategists who maybe could explain why she's been so silent, but silent she has been. Yeah, well, th- yeah. Th- that's why I really like Gavin Newsom. He's, you know, he's a governor of a big state. You and know, boy, and does he know how to put the proper rhetoric out there. Smart. It's rhetoric. It's rhetoric that has been filtered of BS. Yeah. He's not shouting talking points. He's he's holding to facts. He's reasoning through things and explaining situations like no other politician is doing. I like that guy. Yeah, he's he's very well I spoken like and intelligent. Yeah. I've heard like him, him on podcasts and things and I, I'm like, wow, that guy's smart. He knows what he's talking about. Yep. He doesn't just, like you said, say the stupid lines just to kind of get attention or whatever. He, yeah. He's he's well thought out. And so I think he'd be a fantastic president, yep. you know. But uh, I mean, there's other like, I like Amy Klobuchar too. And, you know, I'm from Massachusetts. So my senator, Elizabeth Warren. But, you know, people hate her too. So people hate her too. So I, so that makes me question how effective I like her, but I question how effective she yep. could be because she's so hated. There's a Kennedy guy, um, a Democrat. I want to say congressman in, from some district in Massachusetts. I cannot remember his name. He's very young. Yep. Bright he, red hair. He ran. One of the Kennedys. Yeah, he ran for the um, other Senate name? spot and lost, yeah. actually. Um, What's his name? Um, oh, God, my dad's going to kill me. <laughs> we, I should we, know we're, we're Irish Catholics from Boston. We should. <laughs> we, we love Camelot, believe me. <laughs> and, you know, when, when my son I, and I go through presidents, definitely JFK is my boy. Going to the moon and... Shoo, I should I should remember his name, but I don't. At the mo- it, it escapes me at the moment. But he, um, when he was running for that Senate spot, he you know he got a lot of news time, a lot of news coverage, and I liked his message. I liked the way he laid things out. Now, I don't know what he's doing now. I don't know if he's running for anything currently. Give that guy another another election cycle or two, and it'll be interesting to see if he makes a run for it. Yep. You know who else I like is uh, Pete Buttigieg, but you know with Harris like and Buttigieg, too. I get worried about with the identity politics because there are people in America that won't vote for a gay man. There are people in America that won't vote for a black woman. They just nope. Not but, go- but how many of them are there? Are they? Hopefully enough? not that much. I hope I don't. I just because, have this in my head because we can also say if we roll back time a little bit, there are a lot of people who would never vote for a black man, and yet Barack Obama won. So my question is, and nobody, I guess nobody knows, but how many of those people are out there? Yeah. Those people who won't vote for a black woman or who won't That's vote true. for a gay man. Yes, they're out there. You know, and, and I try to tell people all the time, the MAGA movement is loud, it's dirty, there's a huge dust cloud around it. But how many people are they? That's, you know, you're right. And I don't want to just throw things out there like that, but... Barack I, didn't, o- I didn't say that to check you, I'm just... Barack you know, it's, Obama it's, had to be completely perfect, <laughs> you know? So he was squeaky clean, yeah. he was smart... Yeah. You know, and he, he had no scandals, no. you know, nothing. It's yeah. just one little thing. You know, it would, I mean, he got crap for wearing the wrong color suit. Oh, and like, and like, yeah. you know, and here you have Trump telling people to drink bleach. Yeah. And it's just, it's the juxtaposition. Well, a lot of people is, say, and I tend to agree, uh, Barack Obama is the epitome of the, the, the saying uh, that we have in the black American community that we have to do twice as much to get half the credit. Yeah. I think Barack Obama is a walking example of that. Yeah. I agree. I mean, that's, I mean, you can talk about, this could transition to a different topic. We could talk for hours about how um, the critical race theory people and the people that are trying to whitewash history books, yeah. you know, hey, yeah, we have a long history of bad <laughs> stuff that we did, yeah. starting with slavery. Yeah. England abolished slavery a hundred years before we did. You know, we kept that thing going. We milked that train. Yeah. And then, you know, there's Jim Crow and then there's the civil rights movement. I mean, they weren't letting black people vote. I mean, it's just insane. <clears throat> but, and we should talk about that. Well, and, and I talk about it a lot. Uh, I'm catching a lot of hell on uh, YouTube comments. On It's actually a clip from a longer video that I did with Snoopy. Uh, she and I talked for over an hour, but I took a 10-minute clip out of that and made a separate video on it where I was talking about what it's like being a black man in Norway. And I'm catching a lot of shit in the YouTube comments on that thing because... And I think it has to do with the lack of a so-called racial history here in Norway. Uh, Norway, to its credit, doesn't have that history of 400 years of suppressing yeah. a, a, a race of people. 
So when they hear somebody actually talk about race, Norwegians react to it in a total because they they they're telling me things like, "Well, there is no racism here." <laughs> yeah, you know, we laugh, but 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 I understand why they say that. You know, yeah. if you live in a certain part of Norway, and if you have a certain line of work, and especially if you're not on social media that often, you don't really know what's happening in the world of racism. Yeah. Uh, so I get it, but at the same time, can you not be an intelligent adult and listen when somebody is t- I mean, I mean, I, I could just be a charlatan who's lying, but I would think that some of these people who react as strongly to what I say, when they react that strongly, I would think that they would say, well, what is, where is this guy getting this crap from? Yeah. And then they would go and turn on a different YouTube channel about somebody talking about race and things would start to go around in their head to where they would realize that they're a little ignorant. Yeah. Yep. But people don't do that. They, they, they plant their feet firmly in that concrete and they're going to stand on their view and they're not going to take in anything new. That's Norway. But I also think that that's happening in the USA, uh, fortified by Trump and the MAGA movement. Trump has made it okay to, to, to hold on to those ridiculous, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> Trump, uh, the, 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 the people who talk about critical race theory, you know, DeSantis, uh, Governor Abbott in Texas, they're making it okay to just wipe away entire portions of history. Yeah. And, and you know, they think it's like Norway this- doesn't have the history, but we That's do true. in America, but these people are making it okay to just wipe it away. And that's the absolute opposite of what you should be doing. You know, let's talk about Amen. it. No one's shaming let's anyone. Talk about Listen, it. My family came over during the potato famine. We're Irish. We didn't own slaves. We didn't have plantations. Hardly anyone in America is even a descendant from a slave owner. No one's right. shaming anyone. No. But if we don't talk about it, yes. then how are we going to make sure that stuff doesn't happen again and make sure yeah. that we understand, hey, wait, maybe it is a little bit of a disadvantage being a black yeah. man in the inner city than it is growing up in the suburbs yeah. of if I, Connecticut If I or tell whatever. my story, I'm telling my story in the hopes of finding allies, in the hopes of educating, in the hopes of making a difference so that things get better. That's not an attack on you yeah exactly and i just I, ha- I have to question why do some people get so bent out of shape is this maybe an unintentional attack on you in other words am i hitting something that you've done or am i hitting something that you feel that you know is wrong i say this all the time i don't think there's a lot of racists out there who 100 percent believe in their own racist rhetoric or ideology yeah. i think there comes a time uh, a person becomes an adult, or maybe it happens when they're a kid, but at some point they realize, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to hate black people, but that guy's kind of cool. Yeah. And that right there crushes that rhetoric that, that blacks are this blank, period, final. Yeah. It crushes that. How can you then continue to believe that? So I don't believe there's a lot of those people who exist. I think people continue down that path of racism or denying parts of history for their own security. They're scared of the change yeah. or embarrassed by their own prior hatred or, or viewpoints. So they get locked into this thing where I cannot admit that I was wrong. I've got to, I have to continue wearing the hood. So to speak. Yeah, and, and back to your guest last night with our, well, it aired last night with um, with Norway. He made a lot of good points of if you were walking around his town and you saw a black guy walking around, it was shocking. Whoa, wait, hey, wow! They didn't. They're not exposed to. At least in America, yeah. you know, we grow up with black people. They're, you know, it's, it's they're everywhere. It's it's. I re- I remember when I came uh, first time we went up to Finnmark in two thousand and two. This little kid. I think I said this on that episode yesterday. Uh, this little kid, about four or five years old, looks up at me. He's holding his dad's hand. He says, "Oh my gosh, why are you so dark?" And it was <laughs> cute. It was, but he and his father explained uh, that this kid had literally never seen a black man before. That's cute. That's curiosity. That's an educational moment. Um, I w- I just wish that all 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 people who are not necessarily a racist, but uh, but a xenophobe. or or bigoted in some way could have that childlike curiosity. Okay, I don't like these people, but let me find out about them so that I can either have more reason to not like them or possibly wipe away my hatred. Yep. Because I I don't think anybody really wants to carry hatred. I don't think that's normal. No. It's To me, it's psychopathic, sociopathic to carry around hatred. Nobody wants to do that. Yeah. Nobody wants that. I agree. Well, this ties into, too, like, something I want to pick on you about, not pick on you, but uh, bring up, 
is that you obviously were a former police officer in the Chicago area. Yeah. Now, when you were working there, did you notice <clears throat> systemic racism throughout the police department? I <clears throat> imagine in Chicago area, too. It would be particularly... Uh, I, I called it out on... I had an incident where uh, a uniformed officer had stopped uh, or was actually watching, observing four or five black kids that he thought were up to something. So he called for backup. I showed up in uh, plain clothes. I was a plain clothes uh, narcotics detective. And I show up and this guy, and I'm, I'm saying this to illustrate the normalcy of racism, systemic racism in police forces in the, in the Chicago area. And this guy says to me, me and all of my blackness, and this is a white guy, he says to me, yeah, look at those fucking shines over there. I know them colors are up to no good. Holy crap. In one sentence, or in one, two, two sentences, uh, 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 two, two racial slurs that's, from a fellow police crazy. officer. Um, so I called him out on it and reported it uh, uh, up the chain. The second lesson in that, okay, that illustrates the prevalence of that type of attitude in the police around there. But the second illustration uh, was that um, he basically just got a firm talking to. Okay. By the by, the the brass, you know, I, I in mean, our and it's and it. I don't. I don't want to. This was maybe this was maybe a year before I quit and moved here with Snoopy, but I think that was the beginning. It was a. I don't want to say it was an eye opening moment because, of course, my entire life. Which, by the way, I'm going to plug my audio book now. If you listen to my audio book, I talk about my experiences with racism starting at the age of about seven when we moved from the city to the country. So my entire life, from my childhood on up to my adult years, uh, I've experienced racism in different forms. So I knew it existed, but I think that, that con and I don't think the, 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 the word systemic racism popped into my head, but it just, him doing that and the, the, the bland response to it by the leadership in the department kind of opened my eyes to the fact that, yeah, this kind of, this is a sickness that goes throughout. Yeah, I mean. And what an ugly thing to realize. Um, no, I didn't quit my job because of that. Uh, uh, that's a whole other story-wise, and we can talk about that. Uh, but, but it certainly played a part when there was a decision to make. Do I quit and move to Norway, or do I stay here? That definitely played a part. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. But I'll say this also. I'm talking a lot here. Uh, you're supposed to do most of the talking, <laughs> I guess, but I, but I want to say this also. Um, I don't recognize policing today. Oh. It's so ugly. I agree. It is so the the the, the incidences of of open racism in the police are so clearly seen, and then to see that absolutely nothing is done in so many cases, I just don't recognize that. Now, granted, I'm, I'm telling you also that way back then, I don't think the brass did what they were supposed to. But it's not like every cop I met was a racist. In fact, that was the only racist incident I had or I observed in my department. Now, in the neighboring Ch South Chicago suburbs, yeah, there's a lot of racism. But in my department, that was the only incidents that I observed. Whereas... It, it's it's obviously a systemic issue in police work these days, yeah. which I I don't recognize. These I think these I think there's too many cowards in police. In other words, I see that um, a lot of these guys are um, expressing themselves violently over citizens because they're afraid. Mm. They're afraid. They're under trained. Yep. Um, and I I just don't recognize that. I didn't see guys that were scared back in my day. Uh, we were properly trained. You know, we could take hold of a guy, often bigger than, well, not not bigger than me, but I saw other cops big, take guys that were bigger than them, take them down, and safely and quickly get them in handcuffs. Yep. I didn't see these incidences where they ha they have to beat them, and there's four or five of them, and I, 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 just, I didn't see the callousness back then that I see now. Uh, I want someone to tell me that if they were being hit and twisted, kicked and punched, and they're telling you to put your arms behind your back, would you do that? Yeah. Or would you have a natural instinct to curl up and cover up, thereby not putting your hands back?
behind your back. I, I, that, that there's a certain callousness that happens as you're kicking a guy and you're telling him to put his hands behind his back. Yeah. My, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get that. My problem, I don't recognize my that. problem with the police in America. And I want to make that distinction because I, I'm not sure about the cops here in Norway. I haven't had any real interactions with them, so I don't really know how it works here, <clears throat> but with the police in America, it's the accountability. I mean, the George Floyd thing, finally we saw someone, you know, get held accountable, but I think the police unions are so strong yeah. And they, yeah. so, so they just, they, it's like a gang. They get, get Those away. Police unions come to the rescue. Yeah. And I'm sitting here with a, with a former police officer. You know, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to diss the, the boys in blue and whatever. No, diss but, them where it needs to be done. Because I think they, I think in general, it police, police in America suck. Yep. Now I'm not saying that there's no good cops. I know there's good cops, but why are they so silent? And if those good cops do speak up, the unions come to the rescue of the police officer who is at fault. So it's a, it's a horrible, horrible system. It's not good for them, and it's not good for the citizenry of America. I, I call them out. Yep. There's and nothing you could say about the police that will insult me, they, and, and they, I'm a former cop. They, they have this trope where, oh, it's just a few bad apples, but I think it's a little bit more than that. I think you need to look at it seriously about how they're trained, Yes. In their defense, it's a crappy job. You know, you want to go into a house with some crackhead just beat his wife, and it's, oh, God, I wouldn't want to do that job ever. You know, so I appreciate I that they're going, into, they're, going into bad, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're going into bad situations that yeah. I, I don't yes. want any part yes. of, and, no. and, and I appreciate the need for them. Yeah. But the accountability, and I mean, I talked a little bit about this last time I was on the podcast, is that I've had about, you know, maybe 20, 25 interactions with the police in my life in America. Yeah. And almost all of them, I felt that it escalated and made the situation worse yes. than de-escalating it and having a solution. I mean, they're yes. busting kids for smoking weed in the woods. I mean, come on, yeah. man. And yeah. it's just... Ugh. I think I think there's too many cops these days. <clears throat> Look, I don't believe it's just a few bad apples. Like you said, I think it's a lot of bad apples. I think there are more bad apples today than there were 20 years ago when I was a cop. Uh, I do believe that there's good police out there, but I believe that those good police are often too silent, or if they speak up, they are then silenced. I think police unions are horrible in the sense that they protect the police at the expense of the citizenry. So I think when you combine all of that, and it's not that all police are racist, there are a lot of racist police today, we cannot ignore a few FBI reports. I cannot remember the dates of these reports, but you can look them up easily. Uh, for anybody that wants to fact check me, there are several FBI reports about um, how how uh, prevalent um, uh, racist organizations are in the police. They are actually becoming police with the intent to, you know, have that racist element in the police and make things make changes. It's 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 ugly and and it's ridiculous to ignore that. So you have that, you have police, uh, you, you have police who are racist, you have police who are undertrained, you have police who are afraid. Yeah. So, uh, so those, those, are, those are the main problems in today's police. And again, the main thing probably isn't racism. It's a huge element, but it's not maybe the main thing. I think it is, um, no, how, do I, how do I say this? The racism in the police, I believe, has the strongest negative effect. However... That el those elements of being untrained and of being afraid, um, and and I guess that afraid thing is kind of that us and them, that boys and blue uh, attitude, which I just can't, I don't dig that. Uh, uh, you combine all of those things, those three things, and you've got a system that just doesn't work. Yeah, and this also speaks back to the polarization of America because you know that you have the progressive saying defund the police, that becomes a catchphrase, and everyone takes their side. Yes, and then nothing gets done. Yep. And then you can't improve it. Then then we just are a standstill. And that's I wish they never would have said defund. I know. How about reorganize? It almost reorganize? lost the election. It almost lost yeah, the election. I, I mean, that was that was a big thing. How about reorganize? Or yeah. how about fund, re, re, refund social pro? Yeah, come Figure on, it out. There's a way to fix it. Yeah. Now, it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. We could fix it. Definitely, I think, uh, having more social workers involved yes. in certain situations. Yes. So you don't have a guy with a gun showing up every time. You know, and, and definitely... De-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. Well, that's the fear thing. And that's the, the, the boys in blue, the us versus them attitude. Those two elements that I just talked about. Um, if you have a cop who immediately is putting his hands on somebody or, you know, finger in the face and, and, and sometimes cursing them out, where does that come from? That comes from a sense of superiority mm -hmm. or fear. Yeah. 
and, and it needs to be addressed. It's a huge problem. It needs to be addressed. Yep. Yep. Why can't we just be in charge of everything? Exactly, right? That's right. Let's just bring in the key folk, have them sit here on the couch, and we'll just have a talk with them. Well, you know, that, as, as, <laughs> as funny as that is, and you know, I know you're being cheeky about it, but that's what we need to do. We need yes. to sit and have a meeting yes. with people and yes. say, okay, here's the issue. Yes. How do we deal with this with logic and reason and yeah. not just emotion and, and I'm angry at you and you're yeah. angry at me? Yeah. And, you know. Because, look, I can tell you uh, from experience, police – would rather not have to go on a call for service for a person who is in need of mental health care. So knowing that if it's properly worded that you want to address it, it's not that you're going to defund the police, but that you're going to hire psychiatric care workers or social workers. And part of the city budget is going to go to that. I don't think any police union or individual police officer would be against that. I think that they would appreciate it. Yep, and that might be a good start, you know, so... uh... Well, there's municipalities in... I used to know the names of these towns. I've forgotten. But there are municipalities in uh, upstate New York who have done that in cooperation with social services and local police. And it's worked phenomenally. There's towns that have much, much few, many, many fewer arrests. Uh, There's towns who have cut their police uh, use of force almost in half. So, so it, it, it works and it's, it's, it's documentable. You can, you can use that and apply it. Why it's not being done? Police unions. I'm going to blame it on the police unions. If you disagree, if you're a part of a police union or if you know someone who is, give me a call. I would love to have you on and debate that. And that's beautiful. Again, let's talk it out. Yes. Dialogue yes, I love can dialogue. solve a lot of our I problems. We're intelligent people. We have these brains. We can solve our problems <sighs> we with can. our brains. Yeah. Well, we used to do that. Now we just don't even try to solve anything. We would rather own the libs. Yeah. Yep. We would rather embarrass the deplorables. And yep. and that that there's just no progress in that. Yep. You win points in the moment within your tribe, but you're not making any change. Totally, totally. Okay, let's talk about science. You are, uh, <laughs> would you call yourself a scientist or are you a dude who works? I would call myself a scientist. You would call it's, yourself it's, a it's scientist. Almost a, tell it's tell almost people exactly what you do. And, and this is um, one of the things I enjoyed about our previous uh, conversation, uh, the work that you do. It's just, I could listen to you talk about it forever. Tell people yep. what you do. Well, my career has been in drug development. So I, what I've worked on for my entire 25 career year, 25 year career is, um, weight making cancer drugs. So I've been focusing on cancer drugs. So God bless you for that. We need it. You know, that's another thing too. Like before I get into the details of it is that there's this kind of myth that big pharma is trying to get everyone on drugs. And yet, of course the Oxycontin situation, that's a pain, that's a pain medicine. That's something I have have no part in that. Undeniable that there's a conspiracy that these big farmers are trying to keep people on drugs and, and not even help people like that's, that's absolutely a myth. I have worked in pharma industry for 25 years. I've never seen that type of behavior. Well, you're living proof that there's a side of the so-called big pharma that, that is beneficial. I mean, you guys are finding solutions. Yeah, it's awesome, actually. So most of my career has been working with monoclonal antibodies, and we heard a lot about this during, I think that word kind of became part yeah. of the general conversation during the COVID times because there are monoclonal antibody treatments. But basically what a monoclonal antibody is, it's you can take a B cell and you can manipulate it B cells produce antibodies. So you can culture it outside of a human being and you can manipulate it to make antibodies that will specifically bind to certain proteins. Now, cancer cells are actually have a good quality about them that they have proteins that they express on their surface mm-hmm. that normal that your normal cells of your body don't have. So if you can create an antibody that binds to that protein, yeah. then you can inject it in the body, it'll go throughout the body and find, stick to it. Okay? And and then what we do is we load that up with a nuclear payload. So we take uh, lutetium-177 or, or thorium or whatever the isotope is, and so you have a little targeted nuclear missile that is just going to kill the cancer cells and leave the rest of your cells alone. Now, I've done that work for most of my career, um, but about... So what, what, are you, what, what specifically do you do? Do you find those little nuclear... Uh, we, bombs that we, that uh, we genetically engineer the cells to create those antibodies. We harvest those antibodies and we test them. Okay. So 
There is a bit of animal in vivo testing that we do in mice where you'd have what's called a model where you would take human cancer cells, give those to immune compromised mice to have the human cancer. The mouse is basically a warm body and a host to, yeah. for the human cancer. And then you can inject it and see if you can reduce the tumor size. That's yeah. for an in vivo study. Now, we also do in vitro work where we actually do this in you know a Petri dish, for lack of a better word. It's not really done like that. But what we would do is we would take the cancer cells, put our drug in, mix it with it, and see how cytotoxic, how many of these cancer cells that we can kill with our drug. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's a really cool technology. So what I would do is I would do all phases of that, including taking the antibody, and you have to have a special binding molecule called a chelator that binds the antibody to the radioactive isotope. Okay. And also, working with radioactivity, it's a time thing because radioactivity has a half-life. So you have yeah. to whip this drug up, pick your isotope based on how quick you can deliver it to the hospital because you got to be thinking down the line too. Like, okay, if I have to deliver this drug in the middle of a country and it only has a 12-hour half-life, it's going to be very right. difficult for me right. to, to manufacture this in a way that I can get it to a patient before half of it's gone. So it's very time-sensitive. It's time-sensitive. So... We would do that for, and, and it works really good for blood cancers, lymphoma and leukemia, um, because it's systemically, you can inject it and it will just bind to those blood cells where with solid tumors, it becomes a little bit more tricky, but there's still a lot of great work that's being done right now. I'm a huge fan of, um, I'm just going to get coffee, but uh, I'm a huge fan of monoclonal antibody treatment, but uh, when you can either load them up with a radio Do, do me a favor, light that candle, would you? Gotta have the mood, man. Oh, you know what? That fan is blowing. That's why it's out. Never mind. It's probably gonna blow out. Oh yeah. I forgot about the fan. Yep. Let's see how long he lasts. Okay. So then, what you can do with these antibodies is an antibody. Is, it's a big protein, right? And what you can do, like I said, is you can add the chelator and you can bind it to either a radioactive isotope for a nuclear thing, or you can combine it with a toxin, a cytotoxin. Okay. So you can poison the cell, or you can blast it with a radioactive <laughs> isotope but um those those are kind of sometimes just binding the antibody to the cancer cell can kill it yeah i was going to ask which which method is more beneficial if we're talking about getting rid of uh, a cancer cell well it's a little more complicated because some okay. of these proteins too internalize so if you have the antibody what does that mean the, it goes inside of the cell i see okay so what we're trying to do is we're trying to blast the nucleus and kill right. the nucleus and that's inside of the cell so it gets a little bit, a bit tricky so but if you have an internalizing protein that binds with an antibody, the antibody will be internalized into the cell and can get close to where the nucleus is. Okay. And this is where it also becomes important about picking what isotope you use because there's alpha emitters and beta emitters, um, and they have a range of linear activity. Right. So if you need to use a alpha emitter that has a short range, you need to get that antibody into the cell. If it just binds to the surface, it's not going to have enough range to kill the nucleus. But okay. if you have an internalizing antibody, that, then it's, th that can do it for that type of radioactivity. Right. If you're using a beta emitter, they have a longer line linear energy transfer is what it's called. And then those can just bind to the surface and it'll give enough uh, radioactivity to, to kill the nucleus. What keeps a cancer cell from, you know, in that process when it's being destroyed, what keeps it from, I don't know, leaking or, or poisoning or contaminating yeah. non-cancerous cells around it. What stops that from happening? Because, of course, there's to there's toxicity within that cancer cell. Yes. The human immune system has a very good system of cells called macrophages and neutrophils that can take those pieces of toxin and get rid of them. So, in other words, they're weakened by the destruction of that cell so that the they're body's blown apart natural... And the, gut, the guts are all over the place. So that the and body's then other cells come in and can... sweep it up, Got sweep it. up the mess. Got it. Um, so, I, I'm a huge fan of monoclonal antibody treatment, especially when you combine it with a toxin or a radionuclide. But um, a couple of years ago, I think I mentioned this the, the last time I was on the podcast, my brother died of colorectal cancer. And, oh, I'm um, sorry. Uh, it was devastating. I mean, he was he's my age. He was 47 oh, years old, goodness. and wow. it happened. He got diagnosed, and then eight months later, he was dead. Wow. And it was heartbreaking. Oh, and I'm so I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm still processing it, but, you sure. know, it, it, it's okay. You don't okay. get over something like that. So what I wanted to do at that time is I wanted to work for a company that could deal with colorectal cancer in particular. I felt like that was almost a religious calling. What was your me. calling? Mr. And, Atheist? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just had to hit you with that. So there's a, a company in Norway called Hubro Therapeutics that I'm working for now or 
more or less working for now that creates a vaccine where what we would do is if you have a precondition for colorectal cancer by having something called Lynch syndrome. Okay, Lynch syndrome is a, is a uh, genetic disorder where you are highly susceptible for getting certain types of cancer. Okay. And what happens with Lynch syndrome and with a lot of other cancers is you have a frame shift mutation. So something happens with cancer cells where the DNA does not read the right way and it becomes a cancer cell. So if we can target the mechanism of how that mistaken DNA read happens during the level of transcription, and I'm not going to get so much into cell biology now, but if you can target that specific thing, then you can kill those cells before they become the cancer cells. So in our situation, oh, wow. it would be you a prophylactic. It to the punch. Yeah, yeah, it would be a prophylactic. So you would take this. Interesting. You have, you have Lynch syndrome, you get diagnosed, take this vaccine, and even if you don't have Lynch syndrome, take this vaccine, and then every time that mutation happens... Boom, your own immune system will attack you. Science, y'all. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there's, wow. a, there's a real lot of good things going on. And the key is with, I think, the current field right now, and I'd like to talk to about, about this checkpoint inhibitor thing that's really taking off, is that if we can manipulate the, your own immune system to recognize the cancer cell, then yeah. it can attack it as a foreign body. Right now, cancer cells are giving off chemicals saying, hey, no, I'm one of you. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm one of you. Yeah, don't yeah. don't bug me. And so the antibodies in the cells of the immune system leave it alone. But there's a checkpoint that you can inhibit on that mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, wait, wait, wait. You're not you're not you're not one of my cells and get the immune system to attack that." So right. that's real cutting edge technology right now and what our drug that we would use as the prophylactic would be in combination of a checkpoint inhibitor. Isn't there some animal research? I want to say uh, some scientists have been looking at the regenerative properties of sharks, uh, some lizards, and also uh, uh, octopi, octopuses, is, is, is. octopi. Uh, they have these regenerative, uh, uh, you know, they lose a limb, they can grow it back yeah. like that. Uh, you know, a shark, uh, I, I, saw, I saw on uh, Instagram, there was a shark that had like half of its jaw hanging off. Uh, they put a geolocator on this thing and they found it six months later and it had grown back. So there's things like that. And they're thinking that there may be some something in there that we can apply to cancer research. Do you know anything about those kind of studies? That's not my... That's not really your thing? That's not my field, but I mean, I definitely would love to tap the potential. Anything. All weapons on deck. Let's, yeah, let's do whatever yeah. we can because I mean... Are we? We're doing a pretty good job. You know, but are we I, doing everything we can? People live longer isn't there now. Money? Well, well, I guess, I guess I'm, and I'm, I'm not trying to open any kind of conspiracy theory, but isn't there, doesn't a lot of this have to do with funding and who is funding, you know, what organization or what yep. government is funding? And if it's against the interests of this, that, or the other instance, then it may be suppressed. So in other words, you know, are we really doing everything no, we can? We could do a lot more. And okay. to be honest with you, most of the really cool drugs that work are venture capital or privately funded by a company that wants to make a profit and not funded by government agencies. So yeah. I absolutely believe that Norway does a pretty good job with it. Yeah. They give a lot of money to research. The yeah. research council distributes it to a lot of the stuff that happens at the university. It's really great stuff. We have a radium hospital here. That's actually a top notch yes. cancer yeah. hospital. Yeah. I've worked there and uh, I mean, it's fantastic the work they do there with uh radio immunotherapy and radiation therapy yeah. and, and other treatments. And I think Norway does a good job. I think America, you know, yes, we have um, the, the Institute and whatever that they, they fund, but it's really the private companies that do the development and are yeah. funded by people yeah. that want to be stockholders and make yeah. a profit off of it. And the almighty dollar, if that's the way it works, that's the way it works. As long as if we it, get the drugs out. Yeah. There. If it leads to progress. Yeah. How did you land this job in Norway? Ah, well. Okay, you know, because we kind of started talking about other things when you were talking about coming here, uh, but you came here with no job, but somehow you landed that excellent job right in the field that you have a passion for. Yep. At least partially due to to losing your brother. So what what? Uh, well, how did that happen? I've had some breaks. I've been lucky, but I do have a master's degree in biotechnology, and I have lots of experience working at really good companies in Cambridge. Okay. And for those of you who don't know, Cambridge, Massachusetts is really a yeah. center for that type of excellence. Yes. A and of so, sense. so I've been, you know, before I, I moved to Norway, I was working in biotech in Cambridge for, you know, 10, 15 years. Yeah. And so I had a, a pretty good CV before coming over here. That being said, it's limited how much biotech is really here. 
there's only a handful of companies compared to what I'm used to in the United States. Yeah, because Norway is such a small country. That field is so, so insular. I mean, it's a micro bit of, 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 of all jobs in Norway, but you landed that. Yeah. Is it, uh, was there any sort of exotic Americanness that was appealing to them? Because, because, and, and I, and I asked that because, uh, I know a lot of us come from America with all kinds of degrees, all kinds of work experience, but it's meaningless here in Norway. You could be a, uh, a, a nurse or a licensed practitioner in America with 20 years of experience, but you're going to have to start on day one of a nursing education here in Norway. Yeah. Did you meet any pushback there or did your Americanness was that so doggone exotic? I think it was an advantage. I think it was exotic. Yeah. I think, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm well spoken in English, mm -hmm. you know, so that helped when we're doing scientific writing. I, I, you know, yes. I, took, I took master's level courses in scientific mm -hmm. writing. I think I'm very good at that skill and I communicate well. And yeah. I think that it was... Ooh, an American. Remember, yeah. back then, Barack Obama was president. And everyone loved Americans. Now, <laughs> hey, I came in 2002, and that American thing was big. It certainly opened doors for me. I wouldn't be where I am now if I wasn't an American. Period. Yeah. It opens doors. Oh, the glory days when people loved Americans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, well, of course, 2002, of course, Bush was doing what he was doing, but still, that American ex ex yeah, it was still an exotic. Oh, it's exotic. It, it's yeah, exotic yeah, absolutely. Ooh, wow. And I think it still is to a certain degree. Too. I, I guess it depends on what field you're in. Yeah. Um, the, the thing about my field that I've been fortunate with is that everyone speaks English at the workplace. Yes. So at, at lunch table, it's different. We, it's not a Norse bowl. Yeah. I won't speak Norwegian to this audience. <laughs> How is your Norwegian? It's good. It's, it's good. good. Yeah. It can be better, to be honest with you. I've been a little <laughs> bit spoiled having English-speaking jobs. Yeah. But I do my Duolingo every day, and I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting better. <laughs> they, you know, they offered me free courses here. I took free Norwegian really? courses when I moved over here because oh, yeah, as, an, as an immigrant, as a, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I love talking about my immigration experience, especially with a fellow immigrant, you know, like you. <laughs> but um, they had free courses for me. So yeah. I, when I first came over here, fine, I'll take Norwegian yeah. course for free. You know, what a how, great how long, service it is. How long did you hang out with it, though? I did I took about two, two classes. Years. I, did, I did about two years. I took two days, and I was I'm like, this, is, this doesn't work. It was too slow, yeah. in other words. It was me and a couple of Ukrainians and then all the Filipino au pairs. Uh, that, you know, that's a big thing yes. over here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for me, it was uh, uh, mostly Somali men okay. who were illiterate. They couldn't read or write in their own language. So the level of Norwegian learning was... Ve uh, they played a lot of soccer <laughs> those yeah. two days I was there. And I'm like, this just... This doesn't, this doesn't work. So I was out of there. But I was in San Vika, and actually it's, it, was, it was a great program. Yeah. And uh, I, I actually really benefited from my Norwegian there. But in the workplace, we always spoke English. Yeah. And all our presentations had to be in English. So I was very fortunate in being... Fluent, it's my mother yeah. tongue, right? And yeah. uh, so I think that's always been a big advantage. And you know, being the American guy too, I'm the guy at the office that, hey, Adam, does this sound right? Or am I saying this uh, the right way? Yeah. Is there a better way to phrase this? You know. And so I could help with like, oh no, no, we want to say it like that. The prepositional phrase goes here. You're using this adjective wrong. If you wrong. are an American and you have good writing skills in English, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, as a musician and songwriter. I get a I get a ton of songwriting gigs. I just did uh, uh, I just did the um, the TV text from Norwegian to English mm -hmm. for a film. Okay, cool. Uh, I write all kinds of songs in English for a lot of Norwegian musicians and stuff. So that's a little piece of information to any Americans in Norway who are struggling struggling to find some work. If you're a decent writer. Look for those kind of gigs. They we're kind of in demand for that kind of stuff. The monkey wrench that we have in that is AI, because oh. because our, is songwriting going to be a, a thing? Dirty word. And it's a dirty word. My my wife and I were playing around with it last week. It's, I think it's scary. It's scary. Yeah. It writes it better. You just type in. Okay, I was married this year. I did this this year. Well, and not it, always. Shoo. Yeah, it, it, it's it's very quick. But some I've seen some of those things where it's it sounds mechanical. That's that's the thing, and with music especially, you can't be a robot. It music, to... or if you ask uh, the AI to write you a story. Uh, I'm also you know I'm working on my 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 book, which is out there. John Allen Pod. I gotta plug this. John Allen .com. Go in there. You can get my audio book. It's still in the process of being written, but you get one chapter a week uh, as soon as it's written. Uh, it's all out there. John Allen .com. 
as a writer, I, of course, looked into what can AI do, not for me, because I write my own stuff, but I was curious, what can AI do? Because there are authors out there who are using exclusively AI uh, to write their books. And to me, it always looks so doggone mechanical. I don't think it's good at telling a story. I think it's good for getting information down, which is something different than telling a story or writing a song. I don't think the the AI is at a good level yet. But it's getting there. smarter. But it's getting smarter. And AI is incredibly good at writing music. I'm sure you've heard the stories. Uh, you want a song uh, in the style of uh, uh, Kendrick Lamar. Mm. Come on, AI, and, and it'll do it. Yeah. And it will sound like, you know, I want a song that sounds like, uh, I don't know that they've done it so much with uh, rock or pop, but with hip hop and rap, AI is doing it. And it sounds just like whoever you want it, Drake, you know, whoever. Yeah. And where I think it's a real problem, and this is why they're having the writer's strike, is that if you're writing a sitcom and you're yeah. a producer of a sitcom, why would you pay a team of writers when you can say, okay, a man and his family live in Springfield. Yeah, give me a story. And, yep. and the kid's a skateboarder and yep. the wife has big hair and whatever. And then why would you pay writers Just for describe that? the Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then boom, here's yeah. the Simpsons. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, it's, and, and that's scary. And I, I hope, I hope out of ethics, I know. don't do that. I, I love my I, humanity. And, you know, oh. I, so I, I don't mean to throw a wrench in that, you know, but I, I do have my concerns about art in particular, <sighs> art. Television, well, music, Again, back everything. to the writers, uh, uh, the writers' world. There's a lot of authors who are taking a lot of heat from their fellow authors for using AI to make book covers, because that's a lucrative business for people to get hired in to make a book cover. And now they're losing their gigs because authors are just going to AI. And then there's a question: Well, how can you know who owns the rights to that? Because AI is pulling its ideas from already established pieces of art. So should there be a new system to where it's identifiable where the AI pulled these images from to come up with their own composite? Are people losing money in that avenue in the form of royalties? So there's a lot of ethical questions here, but I, I want to just keep it old-fashioned. I want to write my own stories. Yeah, I want to make my own book cover. I want to write my own music. I want my own lyrics. But I think we're going to be in the minority before long. I don't think we are yet, but I think we're going to. And because it's, AI is too good. Yep. It's too good. And it's not just the arts. I mean, there are going to be a lot of jobs sure. that are become redundant. Why sure. would I pay someone to be a project manager when yeah. a program could do it better yeah. than I could do? Yeah. You know, in my flawed human form or whatever. So I like that's the gonna, flaws. It's gonna, it's, I do too. That's what's beautiful, right? But, uh, you know, it's something that I do have concerns about with employment of humans in the future. There's more people and there's not going to be enough jobs out there. So I, I do have my concerns. When it, let's talk about employment in, in your field for a second. How much does the economy play a role in your employment? You know, if there's no funding out there. Then there's no jobs. Then there's no jobs. So yep. what, what have you seen I've with seen, the current economy? During COVID, for example. It's, it's gone down. When yeah. I first came over here, there were a lot more biotech companies and yeah. there are a lot more options. And I've really noticed over the past few years that it's gotten down to a handful. Yeah. And, you know, biotech's a tough industry. You know, most of the companies fail. Most of the drugs fail. So if you get into this field, and I would recommend this for any young scientists, learn how to run the machines Learn how to do an assay, flow cytometry, ELISA's, cell culture, because those skills are needed. Jobs may come and go, but you have to have an employable skill. You keep your skills, yeah. yeah. So don't fall in love with a job or a company because there's a chance you're not going to be working there in five or six years. But know how to do things. Know how to do practical science work. That's good and advice. Be, and be a good scientist. Be disciplined. Keep your lab journal tight. Do the math correctly. Run the machine correctly. Learn a complicated skill like that. But it's one thing to hold on to those skills, but isn't that quite the blow to one's professional ego yep. to lose a job like that? And then because of the economy, there's just no replacement job. And you have to, to take it to the extreme, go and dig a ditch or flip hamburgers at a restaurant. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle of that situation right now. Um, my company right now um, is, is in a little bit of a funding crisis. And... Yeah. Um, so yeah. I was recently put on pedometering, which means that I can collect money from NAV or whatever. But I am 
currently actively mm-hmm. looking for a job and there's really not a lot out there. I've, uh, you know, you can look on Finn and you, you know, that's our Craigslist over here for those that don't know. And you can look on LinkedIn, but it's, it's limited. So I'm, yeah. I'm opening myself to other opportunities. I think I would be a really good biology teacher or chemistry teacher. And I, I think I'm good at teaching that with kids. Would be a, yeah. And I think that would be a nice job that I would really enjoy. I mean, being an educator, this is, this, I think it's the most noble profession that you can do. You could seed, if you will, a whole different aspect of your competence by being a teacher. Yep. At least for a while. That could be interesting. I think it would be. And, you know, I, I, I'm a coach of a baseball team now, and the, yeah. I love it. The kids listen to me, and that's one thing I'm going to promote here is that if you're an American out there with a kid that wants to play baseball, there are opportunities here. There's a team there in are. Brahman. There's, there's a couple teams in Oslo. We're at the bottom team. There's a team in Christiansand, Trondheim. Get a lot of them have the American coaches, right? An American it's, it's, society. Within, it's very yeah. American. Yeah. It's, it's, it's mostly Americans and their yeah. kids. That like, you know, every American or a lot of Americans like myself in particular, you know, really wanted my kid to play Little League. Yeah, you know, yeah, I had yeah. this dream of me getting a folding chair, you know, <laughs> and a coffee and I sit there on a nice day and watch yep. kids play baseball. Yep. I love that. I, I almost like kids playing baseball better than I like seeing the Red Sox and the Yankees uh-huh. and whatever. I love seeing kids play baseball. So a couple of years ago, my son turned to me and goes, hey, Papa, I want to play baseball. So I called the local club. I said, hey, you know, my kid wants to play baseball. At that time, they had three kids on the team. Oh, wow. And they had a coach. The coach kind of was absentee a lot, so I I, I stepped in and said, "Okay, I'll coach." And yeah. I'm not I'm not an expert at coaching. I know the game of baseball, but since then we have about 12, 13 kids now. Oh, I love and it. And I've taught them the game. You know, we make mistakes, and we need our hitting needs to be better, and so forth. And we work on it every Wednesday. We have practice, and you know, we work on things. But I've now taught them the game of baseball, and it gives them something to do. It doesn't matter what the medium is. It could be piano or chess club or. Yeah. Yeah. or hockey or whatever it is kids need an activity they sure do you know and they're not going to go play for the red Sox. they're not going to go be professional baseball players and they might i, I but hope they probably do not. My, my, my dream is that they do <laughs> you know believe me but but it's that whole experience of them do first of all i think there's a selfish element i would love if my son awesome. were to play oh, not, not for not baseball for me but football that was my thing yeah. got a scholarship and Oh my gosh what a what an ego boost for, for me if my son was doing that would you let your kid play football now though Absolutely. It's a dangerous It dangerous is, sport. but I would make sure he knows how dangerous it is. I would have he would probably like his dad, he would probably be a running back, a tailback, mm-hmm. and I would tell him you've got to be good <laughs> to to avoid getting tackled. I would use the, t- the 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 fear of brain trauma as a motivational factor for him to build his skills. I'm being a little joke, I'm joking a little bit here, but no, I would it is a dangerous game, but but there are safety precautions and helmet technology gets better and better every season. So, uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh... You know, there are teams here. <laughs> there are. I actually, <laughs> I actually was approached to coach uh, the, the team here in Drummond a few years ago, and I just, I, I, ju- I just didn't have the time to do it. And that was also the timing of it was when my son's uh, addiction problems were getting worse and worse, so I was distracted. Uh, but looking back now, I regret not getting involved with uh, with coaching that team. Yeah, yeah. So it, no, the the, the whole uh, the whole uh, American sports thing. If you guys are interested, hit me up or hit up Adam. Um, what's what's the name of? Uh, we, we are over the Hustler is the name of our club with the Royals. Hustler, yeah. Um, but I'll have my contact information linked to this and give me a call. Do or, that. And I would love, all kids are welcome. And you It's know, good for the kids, but it's also good for the adults. I'm sure you guys have your own little society. It's your, awesome. Your friendships, your groupings and everything. It's, it's and awesome. And we need that, American immigrants in Norway. We need that. Yep. It's vital. It's vital. So if I'm going to promote that, I definitely encourage you. Good. And, 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 you know, we have all talent levels too. And baseball is a good sport too for people that aren't soccer players. You don't have to be a super athlete. Look at the major league baseball players. They're all different body types Mm -hmm. with football. I was a really good high school football player. Yeah. Okay. But there got to a point where I knew I wasn't advancing to the next level. Okay. I was an edge rusher. I played defensive end and I was going against a tight end once that was twice my size. And he just (laughs) picked me up and moved me over. And I go, well, what can I do against that? It's a physics problem. Yeah, At that yeah. point, I can't do it. I mean, you're a big guy and whatever. You were able to play tailback in college and everything. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. But I, I knew that my last game in high school, I go, that's it. This shows it. shows yeah. over. Yeah. You know, I can't go to the next level. And, and there are a couple D3 schools I could have w- tried to walk on, but no way. 
it's kind of cool when you mention this, and I do this from time to time, just to think back to what a time in my life that was to be, because uh, I had a, I had a horrible home life. My father was very abusive physically and mentally. Ugh. Uh, so football, sports in general, but specifically football was my outlet. Um, and because I poured so much energy into it because it was literally protecting me (laughs) to be, to be good in football. And I put so much energy into it and I got real good real early. Mm. I think I knew already when I was 11 or 12 that I was pretty doggone good, better than most. I mean, it kind of starts to sink in when you're a, a tailback and you're running and people can't catch you. Yeah. Or if they do catch you, you can run them over, you know. Yep. So it does something with self-confidence. And at the same time as I was so depressed because of my home life, I had enormous amounts of confidence through football. Yep. And then to be, you know, 18 years old, my the, the last season of high school, and to know that I've got a scholarship going, <sighs> and then to awesome. get into that scholarship and to know that the prospects of, of at least having a successful college career and possibly going pro, it, it's, it's, it, just, it makes you feel, it, there's a certain feeling of safety within that confidence. Yeah. It's a, it's sports, what I'm saying is sports is a good thing. It can, cha- it can change lives. Yep. Um, you can be just a dumb, a dumbass athlete, or you can be an athlete who gets into the philosophical side of it get into learning lessons and applying those lessons to your daily life. Yep. Um, ath- athletics can change lives. Absolutely. It's fantastic. And it really I, is. I encourage all kids do it. go yeah. out for baseball. Do it. it. It takes all skill levels. You know, not do everyone's it. a soccer player. Not, not everyone. No, no. It's hockey or skiing. No. There's the three kind of main sports here, you know? And I think baseball is a good sport for most kids. Because, like, as you say, anybody can, you know, you may not be a good hitter, but you could be a great outfielder. Yeah. You may not be a great outfielder, but you might be a kick-ass pitcher. Yep. So There's that, so many different positions within that sport. You we can have find such a something. diversified talent on our team. I bet. That some kids are good at running. Some kids are very slow. Yeah. Some kids can hit the ball far. Some yeah. kids can't. Some kids can pitch. Some kids can't. I mean. Just about every kid can find a spot on a baseball that's, team. That's, that's why I love that sport. Awesome. You know? And you're not limited by body type. Like I said, with basketball right. and football, Kinda if, you're going to reach a level <laughs> where if you're not huge, you can't do that. You know, yeah. yes, is the Steph yeah. Curry's out there and there are the, sure. there are the exceptions. And sure. The, Edelman's and whatever and football, but those are very, very rare. You know, but. I remember uh, going from high school to that first uh, day of showing up for uh, <laughs> for for summer camp uh, in college, and just looking at the size of those guys, Ugh. and then and, and running sprints, and I was no longer the fastest guy. I was kind of just invisible in the middle of the pack, and it was just it, what a but. Again, there there were lessons to be learned in that. You know, it was a humbling experience. And, you know, those are the kind of lessons that I carry into my day-to-day life. A lot of what I do is because of my background and my current situation in athletics as a powerlifter. Yep. Yep, good. Do it, kids. Start with something. And if you don't see anything that's for you, baseball might be it. Yeah. And we have, there are plenty of kids that play baseball here. And we have teams all around the country. And, you know, we play games. And it's fun, fun, fun. For the whole family. Yeah. I mean, all the parents come. and Again, it's, it's yeah, it's fantastic. good for the adults as well. It's, it's a great it's, environment. It's, it's a healthy activity. Yes. You know? If kids aren't doing stuff, they're going to run around the neighborhood and get in trouble. Yeah. you got to give yeah. them some kind of medium. And, yeah, it's baseball. It could be any other thing. But in our situation, baseball works out very well, and i got a great group of kids, and I encourage you all to sign up for your local team. And <laughs> Talking about running around and getting in trouble, what kind of trouble did you used to get into oh, in, uh, God. In, in Boston? Oh, God. You grew up in, in Boston. Well, I grew up in Beverly, which Beverly, is okay. a suburb, suburb a little, yeah. north of Boston. Then yeah. I lived in Cambridge for 10 years, and, you know, all my bad what was boy trouble? days. <laughs> what was trouble for you when you were a kid? Oh, phew. What did that we mean? Go, we, we'd go out and drink and smoke in the woods. I mean, it was... Uh, <laughs> It wasn't anything real bad, but I mean, it's almost comical when when kids, boys especially, do stuff like that because what and they think they're so cool. But what's cool? Yeah, I'm smoking. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm drinking. But what what is that? Nothing. What's nothing. wrong with us? Why like I said, <laughs> up until up until I was about you know maybe 23 and maybe even a little bit longer. If you ask my wife, I was really I was an idiot. I didn't I didn't know what the hell was going on, and I it just you know it, I really need to 
in, in my older years, you know, when I hit 30 and I started to mature a little bit, yeah. you know, I calmed down and stuff. But even when I was living in Cambridge after I graduated, you know, I was a hotshot scientist in the city. I had my group of heavy metal friends. We yeah. played in all the bars and, and all shows around uh, yeah. Cambridge and Boston area. Yeah. And it was like a whole scene, you know, and tattoos and black T-shirts and, you know, we were, we were cool. But, I look at how my mindset has changed from... I mean, I'm such a different guy now than what I was when, you know, when I, when we had our daughter in 2005, that was a turning point. It's like, okay, this is different now because Snoopy and I had been married for, we had been together for five years at that time with no kids, you know, living that lifestyle as a, as a, as a married couple with no kids. Uh, and then we get a kid and I'm like, okay, now things are a little different. And then things got to be very different when we had our son in 2007. So I go from that fast forward to now. And how my mindset has yeah. changed. We're ne- I don't think we're ever finished. No. And, I, you know, back in my early 20s, I thought I knew everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I look back at that kind of guy. Like, That's the thing. I look back. Kid, I, you knew yeah. nothing. You knew- I look back to me at 40 and I was a knuckle. I didn't know half of what I know. Well, I mean, I'm sure I did. But, you know, it, it's just a, it's, it's, a, it's an ever changing process if you are curious. Because if you're curious, you're always going to be learning new stuff, yep. which is going to change your outlook, which is going to change your mindset. Yep. Good conversation. One thing I need to do is promote. I need. I got one thing I need to promote. Yeah. If you're giving the medium, sure, sure. My sister-in-law, Caitlin Garbin, is on an anarcho television show called Camo. Caitlin Garbin, can you spell it so people oh, can search geez. it? K a t e y l n. But the the TV show is Camo. C a m m o. It's about Camo. C a m m o. It's okay. a, a TV show about a social media influencer that hits rock bottom and has to um, be a caretaker for a Down syndrome girl. And my sister-in-law. Ah. Has, has Down syndrome and she's the star wow. of the of the show. So How cool they, is that? You got to watch it too, John. I'm you gonna. It, so it's camo. It's, a, it's on Anarcho. It's a really good show. It's in Norwegian, so for the American audience, you might be able to follow along. But it, it is in Norwegian. I will say that. Challenge yourself. Watch those kind of programs. You'll learn Norwegian quicker. You know that brings up a good point. Is that yeah. watching Norwegian TV shows like uh, the Hitta show that we watch and whatever? You know those really because that shows dialogue. That shows how people talk. It was vital to me. Now I, I learned Norwegian very quickly. Within a couple of months, I was able to com- have conversations. That's with crazy. People. It's a hard language. I didn't think it. Uh, well, maybe but, you have I don't a know, but I but I have a thing with I, when I lived in Okinawa, in Japan. I learned Japanese. Wow. Um, I was also fluent in Spanish. When I when I was working as a cop, so languages have always been easy easy uh, for me. But uh, <clears throat> but anyway, it, it was it was vital to me to be able to watch Norwegian TV, but also read. I read Norwegian comics, little kitty com- Spider Man or yeah. you know uh, Donald uh, Duck. Yeah, d- d- well, no, I, cause I'm not a Donald fan. It's uh, big over I, here. But I, I read Calvin and Hobbes, Tommy Otigan, as I'm, as they call him here in uh, in Norway, and and that was vital to me learning quickly. You just kind of get the rhythm, the flow of it. When you hear it, when you see the text on TV, and when you're reading simple things like that, to me, it was vital. It made yeah. me get into the rhythm. So that's another suggestion for you Americans in Norway who are struggling with learning Norwegian. Watch TV and read comic books. Yeah, there you go. And, and then, uh, so they are filming season two right now. Camo. So, so, yep. So C-A-M-M-O. Check it out, people. Yep. So it is, season one is already on NRCO. So if you have NRCO, which I think everyone does. Yes. Automatically. Yeah, yeah. Um, then, no choice. <laughs> then you can uh, watch season one. They're short episodes, easy to watch. Is this her first acting gig or? She, yeah, it's her first acting gig. She's famous because she was a leader in Special Olympics. She won five gold medals in Beijing. I think I know who she is. She's kind I of famous. She's I've... on TV a lot. She's yeah. on uh, Linmo and you know those. That's where I saw her on Linmo. So talk, it's a it's a talk show. Another suggestion for Americans in Norway: if you want to get a little bit of info about Norwegian society and who's doing what, watch those talk shows like Linmo, uh, Skavlan, and things like that. Yeah. So she is known, and um, I, I, yeah, that's where I saw her. I saw her on Linmo. So she's been on the news a bunch of times, and but now she's got the leading role in. Yeah, and she's awesome in it too. I love it. She's I'm going to check it out. Awesome. And it is a fantastic show. It's fun for the whole family. It's I'm great. Check I mean, it it's out. it's a fun, easy, good show to watch, you know. It's a social media influencer and uh she just got married. My sister-in-law just got married to her wife um last year or this year, earlier yeah. on in the year, and uh all the, the actress was there that's also the co-stars with her. So I got to meet her. That was really nice and uh yeah, I mean, it's I it's it. a it's a feel-good story. She's a great actor. 
you know we need more stories like that we need more actors uh, with diverse backgrounds as well that is a big problem in norway mm. i think is it okay i th- i think when i watch norwegian television uh when i watch when i look at the news anchors when i look at the actors in the films or the television programs when i look at the program leaders for talk shows and things like that i see the same thing it's the same people that do all exactly. the roles. I, I see that too. Exactly, that's the point. And, and so to see somebody new step in, like your sister-in-law, thumbs up. We need more of that. Yeah, yeah. it's a great show, though. A little so more I, variation is needed. If you're if you hate the D word, diversity. If you hate that word, well, let's just say variation. Yeah, we need some yeah. more variation. Yep. So they're filming season two now, and, that, and so that'll be coming out probably at the end of the year or something. But uh, catch up on season one, and uh, it's it's camel great. camel. Yep. Check it out, y'all. Good. Thanks for letting me promote it here. No, I, I, and that that's also something I like to do. I like to see my friends come on my program here. And if you got if you're an artist or a musician or whatever, if you have a sister in law who's doing something cool, I want to open the doors to to help promote it. It's just cool to have a platform where I can help other people push whatever's going on in their lives. Yep, totally. I'm all for it. You, you, let me go back just briefly. You are in between uh, jobs right now. Oh no, have you have you found something already? You're in the interview process, aren't you? I'm in the interview process, so um, I've sent my resume out there for a couple places, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And I have a lot of, I have a pretty strong network here, so I I, I fantasize about the teacher (laughs) thing, but realistically, I'm going to be going back to the lab. I I, I see myself getting some sort of job where... So you seem to be comfortable then in this in-between period. It's not messing with your head? It's not great. You know, it's, it's never it, fun. It's been, it's Uncertain. been a little bit. That's that's what I hate. You know, my son's like, oh, wait, you don't have to go to work tomorrow. But it's not a vacation. I'm stressed. Yeah. You know, like, oh, shit, I got to have a job. And yeah. we have a little bit of a social safety blanket, like I mentioned, with Nav. So I'll get, a you know, but 60% still, or something of my paycheck. Um, still, it's, it's... I know. It's, it's, it's not the greatest thing, you know, and yeah. I'm definitely stressed. Yeah. But uh, I feel that if I just keep my head down, check... LinkedIn, check Finn every day, send my CV out to whoever, be open-minded to different opportunities, even if it's not exactly what I want to do. I was going to say, with the background that you have, with the education, and also with the practical work experience that you have, you could probably very easily, uh, if not go right back into the same line of work, get something similar. Yeah, I, I, and I and I so, hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I'm but putting it's, it's, good vibes out there for thanks, you by saying thanks. that. Thanks, I appreciate. It. But it's 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 tough right now. The sure. biotech industry is not sure. what it was when I first came over here. I guess it was 2010 we moved over here, so 13 yeah. years ago. Like I say, I was thinking about the economy and what's happened over the last few years, and wondering what that does with funding, which then will do something with job opportunities. Yep. So, but if any biotech company out there hey. is looking for a scientist. <laughs> Or a CMC manager or manufacturing control, something like that. I have a I'm not exactly sure what my demographic is, but maybe <laughs> there's some of those people watching and listening. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think I'll end up on my feet soon. You know, I haven't reached the That's panic good. point yet. No. You know, no. so I, I got a little bit of time and believe me, I'm working at it every day. It's, is there uh, anything good about being in be- in between gigs right now? Of course we know it's stressful. Of course we know it's uncertain. But is there anything good about it? <sighs> I got more time to play guitar <laughs> No, but I, it, you know, it's, it's, it's actually been, I've been busy because being okay. a baseball coach yep. and then doing the band thing. Yep. And then there's a lot of work. We have a, we have a nice single family home that has a big garden. So I've been able to gardening is one of my favorite activities. My wife and yeah. I do a lot of gardening and we have a nice big yard to That's very therapeutic we, Oh, I love on it. a personal level, but to do it with your spouse, that's a bonding moment. Is it not? It's fantastic too, because she's a very different person than I am. You know, she doesn't like heavy metal and she doesn't like sports and she doesn't like, you know, some of the kind of same activities, but with gardening, we both love it. And it's an activity that we can do together and we don't even have to talk to each other. When we're just out there working in the garden, it is so zen and peaceful and therapeutic. Don't you love those moments in I, a marriage? I love it. I love it. I'm not saying we don't have a lot in common. I mean, my, my wife, I mean, we, we have a lot in common. But we're no, but just kind of different people. I'm, you know, the heavy metal. It's the puzzle piece yeah. thing. You're opposites and yet it fits. Yep. No, or not necessarily opposites, but just different and yet you fit. It's the same thing with Snoopy and I. Yep. But I our, appreciate the difference. Our gardening activity is fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. and we, and we grow a lot of our own vegetables and we freeze them and keep them for the winter. So good, good I for think you. that yeah. it just it's a fantastic activity. We both love it and uh, we have a lot of plants. She, awesome. We're a little bit addicted to planting and <laughs> and I mean inside and Do you guys outside. have a greenhouse? We have a winter garden that we just built okay. that is essentially a greenhouse and we have a greenhouse. So, <laughs> so Okay, we, hold on both. now. You have a winter garden 
But that's not a greenhouse. No, that's it, a, it's, a, it's attached to the house. So it's like a greenhouse ah, is kind of attached gotcha, to the house. Gotcha. Um, and then outside the house, we have a, a small greenhouse that we built. Okay. So that we gotcha. can keep our olive tree and books bomb and, and things like that um, over the winter so they don't freeze out here. It, if you don't know Norway, it gets very cold and snowy here in the wintertime. I, I tried to grow a. Uh, olive tree last i got it last fall snoopy bought it for me my little project to keep that son of a gun alive uh i didn't put it in a greenhouse but i did keep it inside and that son of a gun still died by the second week of december gone that's we it have, almost broke my heart because it was beautiful no, it, it was a gift it was a gift from snoopy and i'm like this thing i'm just this is my little project died with the olive tree i mean we, we bought this olive tree kind of like you're talking about. And then the first winter, we did keep it inside because we didn't have a greenhouse. Yeah. And it almost died. And so next year we go, we can't do that. We can't bring it inside again. It has to be in a greenhouse. Do the greenhouse. And so we did that, and now it's doing great. So I might, I might try to put together a greenhouse and get that son of a gun run in and keep me keep myself in the olive I, tree. I built it myself i just bought a bunch of two by twos and uh you, yeah, it's not you, hard. you know a miter saw yeah. and just cut all the angles and... i saw a, i saw a do-it-yourself guy on youtube and it's it's just one two three and there it is you've got a greenhouse yep uh, let me ask you something um as we wind things up i always ask all my guests i think i've incorporated this since you were on that first time a couple years ago but since then i've incorporated this thing at the end of the show where i ask my guests to do two things uh, the first thing I'm going to ask of you, I'm going to say three words, and I want you to finish the sentence. Just one sentence. Okay. I'll say three words, you finish the sentence. Ready? Yep. Adam O'Shea is? Scientist, father, husband. Scientist, father, husband. Those are the three jobs that I cherish the most, and not in that order. You know, I, I love being a dad, and... Uh, I love my wife more than anything in the world. So uh, it's being a family man is really uh, the most important thing to me. No conflict between those three things. You know, does the job get in the way of the family? Does the family detract from focus on the job? Ever? No, not at all. You not found at all. that balance. Not at all. It's a very. I have a very zen. You know, besides the current situation is a little bit dodgy right now, but I have a very zen, balanced lifestyle. I see you know, that. That's that's a really good thing about Norway too. Is you know, mm-hmm. the vacation work-life balance here yeah. is so much better. Yes. And my, my father's like, oh, well, how do you guys get anything done if you guys have five weeks vacation? And I tell him, I go, we're more efficient. It's because actually Because we can better. rest. Yeah, you're supposed to. We have that time away from the job to do the things that we enjoy, the things that we love with people that we love. That makes us more effective when we go back to work. Yep. I, I, I Learn something, America. Come on now. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. So that's how. Okay. That's the first thing I wanted to ask of you. Uh, the second thing is, um, as you know, <clears throat> or if you've forgotten, I'm going to remind you. I ask people on my show because I think they're interesting, or they are people who inspire me in some way, motivate me. Uh, they're people who I think I can learn something from, uh, and you fit all of those categories. That's why you're here. I like you. Uh, you're a like good guy. Flattery. It's it's uh it's it's wonderful to talk to you. I love your intelligence. I love your humor. Um, I love your inspiration and motivation. Um, your focus, your drive, your success is inspiring and motivating. So along those lines, I always hope that my viewers and listeners can also gain inspiration, motivation, that they can learn something. Can you look into the camera right there and just say a few words? Because there are people out there who I, I think we all in different forms need inspiration, motivation, uh, uh, um, a clap on the back or a push or a pull. Can you say something to the camera, to my viewers and listeners? Definitely. I think what's really important in life, especially as you get older and you you start to become complacent in things, is to really challenge yourself and do something that will make you feel uncomfortable. For me, that was being an immigrant. I think it was, it's such an incredible experience moving to another country where you don't really speak the language. You may know, I knew a little bit of Norwegian maybe when I came here. You don't know how the culture works. The electricity is different. Everything was so different and bizarre when I moved over here. And I think if you can challenge yourself and achieve that challenge, it doesn't have to be as extreme as being an immigrant and moving to another country. You know, that was just kind of my trip. But make yourself uncomfortable and do something outside of the box, and you grow tremendously from those types of experiences. 
I can't add anything to that. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's that's very inspirational. Basically, uh, people, you, it doesn't have to be a painful process to advance through life. It can be comfortable. Uh, it can be. Um, I think when people find, here I am saying I couldn't add anything to it, and I'm adding something to it. I think when people find their passion in life, just don't let anything get in the way of it. Isn't that basically what it is? It's, yeah. it, it's, it, it can be a comfortable process. The struggle, in other words, can be a comfortable process if we are people who, um, yeah, I, 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 usually, I, I like to say that I enjoy challenge. Yep. And on top of that, if I could just add one more thing, is Please. that, is that uh, find out what you like to do and do that activity as much as you possibly can. We're only go. here for a short yeah. period of time. Yeah. It's like mushroom picking. My wife and I love going picking mushrooms. You know, it doesn't matter what the activity is. Find what you like to do and then do that as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Amen to that. Listen, um, thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing a few words with me. Um, My pleasure. We're going to do this again. Definitely. Uh, next time we're going to set aside some time. I'm going to ask you to bring a guitar. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, by then I'll have my new mixer set up. Oh, and awesome. let's just let's just see what we can do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I look forward to it. Adam O'Shea, everybody. Remember, go out there, love, and be loved, and enjoy the process. Thanks. Bye.